an arrow in a sunbeam by sarah orne jewett this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org an arrow in a sunbeam by sarah orne jewett the minister of a fashionable church had noticed sunday after sunday a little old lady with a sad patient face dressed in very shabby mourning, sitting in the stranger's pew. Like Job, this good man could say, The cause that I knew not I sought out. He soon learned from the sexton her name and residence, and was surprised to find her in the very topmost room of a house, amid evidences of real poverty. In the one little window bloomed a monthly rose and a vigorous heliotrope, and beside the pots lay half a dozen books, such as are rarely seen in the homes of the very poor. On the wall hung two fine engravings, and an old-fashioned gold watch was suspended from a faded velvet case over the mantelpiece. Her story, when she was induced to tell it, was neither new nor startling. She had long been a widow. Her children had been called from her till now she had but one, and he, being a cripple, could do little more than supply his own absolute wants by his work as a repairer of watches. The pastor was charmed with her patient endurance of what others would call the hard discipline of life, and when he left her he felt that he had been a learner instead of a teacher in that poor room. Being too delicate to allude to her apparent poverty, he said at parting, "'As you are a stranger among us, I will send some of the visitors of the church to cheer and comfort you.' He selected two bright rosy girls, full of life and happiness, of whose visits among the poor he had often heard. They came to the widow like sunbeams through a storm. They talked cheerily, and did not appear to notice the bareness of the room. They asked something of her history, and told of their grandmothers, who also had seen much sorrow, and in this way drew her out till she told of her former competency, of her early advantages in England, and of all the misfortunes which had brought her to her present position. And yet, she said, I have little to complain of while I have the love and tender care of such a son as Walter. Little by little, without a complaint from her, they found that the old lady lacked many things for her comfort. Their sympathies were aroused. It would be a delight to make her happy by gifts that would be of service to her. Lucy Gray, a girl full of fun as well as of kindness, said, I wish you would let me make you a bonnet. I make lovely ones. Grandma won't wear a milliner's bonnet. She likes mine so much better. Grace Wheeler volunteered to make a dress and caps, adding playfully, As my dear Grandma is gone, you must let me adopt you and do all I can for you. There are four of us girls always looking round for somebody to help. You can call on us for anything you want. Four young girls who laughingly styled themselves the Quartet of Mercy met at Grace Wheeler's house with the materials for a dress and a bonnet and caps. The old lady was coming two hours afterward to be fitted, having been measured before they left her house. The girls were in a perfect gala of joy that bright afternoon. They chatted merrily while working, and one would have thought they were making costumes for comic tableau rather than the garb of a sorrowful widow. "'I'll tell you, girls,' said Lucy Gray. "'The old dowager will shine when she gets my bonnet on.' And trying it on over her chestnut curls, she added, "'I half wish I was a downfallen lady myself, a haberdasher's daughter from England. Oh, I hope I shall be a widow some time. Widow's caps are so becoming.' "'Well,' replied Grace, laughing, "'do your best for Goody Horn, and maybe she'll let you have dear Walter. Then you'll be a widow soon. He's so feeble.' "'Oh, I wish I had the dressing of her. She'd surprise herself,' as the Dutchman said. "'I'd put a canary-colored pom-pom and a white aigrette in that bonnet, and here she slipped a scarlet bird out of her own hat, and stuck it into a fold of the crepe Lucy was laying on to the old-fashioned close frame. I'd make her an upper skirt with a tie back, at starlet stockings and low shoes, and—' "'Phew! You'd make the dear old soul look like Mother Hubbard,' cried another. "'No!' said Grace, but she looks now like little Dame Crump with her brand new broom. And no doubt Walter looks either like Mother Hubbard's dog or I don't know what. Oh, by the way, did you notice a violin on the bureau? 
Whoever gets dear Walter will have a chance to do all the family dancing. The dowager's too old and Walter's too lame, but there, what stuff I'm talking. It's well mother isn't within hearing. She won't let me have any sport. But I do think old folks are so comical. I'll do anything in the world to help them, though. They worked on some time, and in the real kindness which was hidden under this nonsense, they laid plans for the dear old stranger's future comfort. Why, girls, it's time she was here now. Nora, called Grace as a girl passed the door, when an old lady comes, send her right upstairs. There was an old person here an hour ago, and as you told me not to let anyone in who asked for you for an hour, I told her to sit down in the hall. I suppose she's there now. I, I forgot all about her, was the reply. Grace flew down, but no one was there. That was some old beggar who'd got tired of waiting. I'm sure she'll be here soon, said Lucy. But she did not come, and they grew tired of waiting to try on the dress and hat. So they resolved to go all four together the next day to the opening at Madame Horn's to carry the things themselves. They did so, but when the dowager opened the door at their knock, they hardly knew her. She looked straight and solemn and cold. She did not even ask them in, but they went in and seated themselves. Grace said, "'You didn't come yesterday to try on the dress, and thinking you might be ill, we brought it here.' "'But I did go, ladies. I went an hour earlier than you asked me to beg that the dress might be cut perfectly plain, without upper skirt or flounce. The girl seated me in the hall, and while I sat there, I was forced to hear myself and my son ridiculed and turned to scorn in a way I could not believe possible. I have done nothing to merit this. I never begged of you, nor sought your sympathy in my sorrows, and I cannot understand why I made the butt of your scorn. Oh, Mrs. Horn, cried Lucy, we are only in sport. I hope you will forgive us. Is it sport to cast contempt on an aged woman who has been walking for years in a fiery furnace upheld and comforted by God? Is it sport to ridicule an unfortunate boy who has a continual warfare with pain to keep up his poor home? Oh, don't speak of it again, said Grace, blushing deeply and half ready to cry, as she untied the package in her hand while Lucy unpinned the paper that held the bonnet. "'Put them up, please, young ladies. I cannot look on them, and I never could wear them. When you first came I told Walter that I felt as if a sunbeam had come into the house and remained behind you. Last night I told him that my new sunbeam had an arrow concealed in it.' "'But you will take the things, after all our trouble?' implored Grace, with tears dropping from her eyes. "'No, never.' I can hear the gospel in my old clothes. I should take no pleasure in these. They are associated with too painful thoughts. I hope God will bless you, children, and save you from an old age of poverty, and give you what He has given me, a full trust in His love and tenderness. Good-bye. You can imagine the feelings of those young girls when they left that poor room in tears. Respectful treatment is more to the sensitive poor than gifts of food, garments, or money, and nothing is so likely to harden the hearts of the young as the habit of getting sport out of the sorrows and infirmities of others. End of An Arrow in a Sunbeam Recording by Jessica Louise, St. Paul, Minnesota Beowulf Retold by Hamilton Wright, maybe. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Henry Fregon. Beowulf. Retold by Hamilton Wright, maybe. Old King Hrothgar built for himself a great palace covered with gold with benches all round the outside, and a terrace leading up to it. It was bigger than any hall man had ever heard of, and there Hrothgar sat on his throne to share with the men the good things God had given him. A band of brave knights gathered round him, all living together in peace and joy. But there came a wicked monster, Grendel, 
out of the moors. He stole across the fens in the thick darkness and touched the great iron bars of the door on the hall, which immediately sprang open. Then, with his eyes shooting out flame, he spied the knight sleeping after battle. With his steel fingernails, the hideous fiend seized thirty of them in their sleep. He gave yells of joy and sped as quick as lightning across the moors to reach his home with his prey. When the knights awoke, they raised a great cry of sorrow, whilst the aged king himself sat speechless with grief. None could do battle with the monster. He was too strong, too horrible for any one to conquer. For twelve long years, Grendel warred against Hrothgar, like a dark shadow of death. He prowled round the hall, and lay in wait for his men on the misty moors. One thing he could not touch, and that was the king's sacred throne. Now there lived in a far-off land a youngster called Beowulf, who had the strength of thirty men. He heard of the wicked deeds of Grendel, and the sorrow of the good king Hrothgar. So he made ready a strong ship with fourteen friends, set sail to visit Hrothgar, as he was in need of help. The good ship flew over the swelling sea like a bird, till in due time the voyagers saw shining white cliffs before them. Then they knew their journey was at an end. They made fast their ship, grasped their weapons, and thanked God that they had an easy voyage. Now the coast guard spied them from a tower. He set off to the shore, riding on horseback and brandishing a huge lance. Who are you, he cried, bearing arms and openly landing here. I am bound to know from whence you come before you make a step forward. Listen to my plain words and hasten to answer me. Beowulf made answer that they came as friends to rid Hrothgar from his wicked enemy Grendel, and at that the Coast Guard led them on to guide them to the king's palace. Downhill they ran together with the rushing sound of voices and armed tread, until they saw the hall shining like gold against the sky. The guard bade them to go straight it to it, then, wheeling round on his horse, he said, It is time for me to go. May the Father of all keep you in safety. For myself, I must guard the coast. The street was paved with stone, and Beowulf's men marched along, following it to the hall, their armor shining in the sun, clanging as they went. They reached the terrace, where they set down their broad shields. Then they seated themselves on the bench, while they stacked their spears together and made themselves known to the herald. Hrothgar speedily bade them welcome. They entered the great hall with measured tread. Beowulf, leading the way, his armor shone like a gold network. His look was high and noble, as he said, Hail, O king! To fight against Grendel, single-handed I have come. Grant me this, that I may have this task alone, I and my little band of men. I know that the terrible monster despises weapons, and therefore I shall bear neither sword nor shield nor buckler. Hand to hand I will fight the foe, and death shall come to whomsoever God wills. If death overtakes me, then will the monster carry away my body to the swamps. So care not for my body, but send my armor to my king. My fate is in God's hands. Hrothgar loved the youth for his noble words, and bade him and his men sit down to the table and merrily share the feast, if they had mind to do so. As they feasted, a minstrel sang with a clear voice. The queen in cloth of gold moved down the hall and handed a jeweled cup of mead to the king and all the warriors, old and young. At the right moment, with gracious words, she brought it to Beowulf, full of pride and high purpose. The youth drank from the splendid cup and vowed that he would conquer the enemy or die. When the sun sank in the west, all the guests arose. The king bade Beowulf guard the house and watch for the foe. Have courage, he said. Be watchful. Resolve on success. Not a wish of yours shall be left unfulfilled if you perform this mighty deed. 
Then Beowulf lay down to rest in the hall, putting off from his coat of mail, helmet, and sword. Through the dim night Grendel came stealing. All slept in the darkness, all but one. The door sprang open at the first touch that the monster gave it. He trod quickly over the paved floor of the hall, his eyes gleaming as he saw the troop of kinsmen laying together asleep. He laughed as he reckoned on sucking the life of each one before the day broke. He seized a sleeping warrior, and in a trice had crunched his bones. Then he stretched out his hand to seize Beowulf on his bed. Quickly did Beowulf rip his arm. He stood up in full length and grappled with him with all his might, till his fingers cracked as if they would burst. Never had Grendel felt such a grip. He had a mind to go, but could not. He roared, and the hall resounded with his yells. As up and down he raged, with Beowulf holding him in a fast embrace. The benches were overturned. The timbers of the hall cracked. The beautiful hall was all but wrecked. Beowulf's men had seized their weapons and thought to hack Grendel on every side, but no blade could touch him. Still Beowulf held him by the arm. His shoulder cracked, and he fled, wounded to death, leaving hand, arm, and shoulder in Beowulf's grasp. Over the moors, into the darkness, he sped as best he might, and to Beowulf was the victory. Then, in the morning, many a warrior came from far and near. Riding in troops, they tracked the monster's path, where he had fled, stricken to death. In a dismal pool, he had yielded up his life. Racing their horses over the green turf, they reached again the paved street. The golden roof of the palace glittered in the sunlight. The king stood on the terrace and gave thanks to God. I have had much woe, he said, but this lad, through God's might, has done the deed that we, with all our wisdom, could not do. Now I heartily love you, Beowulf, as if you were my son. You shall want nothing in this world, and your fame shall live forever. The palace was cleansed. The walls hung anew with cloth of gold. The whole place was made fair and straight, for only the roof had been left altogether unhurt after the fight. A merry feast was held. The king brought forth out of his treasure a banner, helmet, and mail coat. These he gave to Beowulf, but more wonderful than all was the famous sword handed down to him through the ages. Then eight horses with golden cheek plates were brought within the court. One of them was saddled with Hrothgar's own saddle, decorated with silver. Hrothgar gave all to Beowulf, bidding him enjoy them well. To each of Beowulf's men he gave rich gifts. The minstrels sang. The queen, beautiful and gracious, bore the cup to the king and Beowulf. To Beowulf she too gave gifts, mantle and bracelets and collar of gold. Use these gifts, she said, and prosper well. As far as the sea rolls, your name shall be known. Great was the joy of all till evening came. Then the hall was cleared of benches and strewn with beds. Beowulf, like the king, had his own bower this night to sleep in. The nobles lay down in the hall. At their heads they set their shields and placed ready their helmets and their mail coats. Each slept, ready, in an instant to do battle for his lord. So they sank to rest, little dreaming what sorrow was to fall on them. Hrothgar's men sank to rest, but death was to be the portion of one. Grendel, the monster, was dead, but Grendel's mother still lived. Furious at the death of her son, she crept to the great hall and made her way in, clutching an earl, the king's dearest friend, and crushed him in his sleep. Great was the uproar, though the terror was less than when Grendel came. The knight slept up, sword in hand, the witch hurried to escape. She wanted to get out with her life. The aged king felt bitter grief when he heard that his dearest friend was slain. He sent for Beowulf, who, like the king, had had his own sleeping bower that night. The youth stood before Hrothgar, 
and hoped that all was well. "'Do not ask if things go well,' said the sorrowed king. "'We have fresh grief this morning. "'My dearest friend and noblest knight is slain. "'Grendel, you yourself destroyed with the strength given you by God. "'But another monster has come to avenge his death. "'I have heard the country folk say there were two huge fiends "'to be stalking over the moors, "'one like a woman, as near as they could make out. "'The other had the form of the man.' but was huge or far. It was he they called Grendel. These two haunt a fearful spot, and land of untrodden bogs and windy cliffs. A waterfall plunges into the blackness below, and twisted trees with gnarls roots overhang it. Unearthly fire is seen gleaming there night after night. None can tell the depth of the stream. Even a stag, hunted to death, will face his foes on the bank rather than plunge into those waters. It is a fearful spot. You are our only help. Dare you enter this horrible haunt? Quick was Beowulf's answer. Sorrow not, O king. Rouse yourself quickly and let us track the monster. Each of us must look for death, and he who has the chance should do mighty deeds before it comes. I promise you, Grendel's kin shall not escape me. If she hid in the depths of the earth or the ocean. The king sprang up gladly, and Beowulf and his friends set out. They passed stony banks and narrow gullies, the haunts of goblins. Suddenly they saw a clump of gloomy trees overhanging a dreary pool. A shudder ran through them, for the pool was blood red. All sat down by the edge of the pool. While the horn sounded the cheerful blast, in water were monstrous sea snakes, and on the jutting points of land were dragons and strange beasts. They tumbled away, full of rage at the sound of the horn. One of Beowulf's men took aim at the monster with his arrow, and pierced him through, so he swam no more. Beowulf was making ready for the fight. He covered his body with armor, lest the fiend should clutch him. On his head was a white helmet, decorated with figures of boars, worked in silver. No weapon could hurt it. His sword was a wonderful treasure. With an edge of iron, it had never failed any one who had needed it in battle. "'Be like a father to my men, if I perish,' said Beowulf to Hrothgar, "'and send the rich gifts you have given me to my king.' He will see that I had good fortune while life lasted. Either I will win fame or death shall take me. He dashed away, plunging headlong into the pool. It took nearly the whole day before he reached the bottom. While he was still on his way, the water which met him. For a hundred years she had lived in those depths. She made grab at him and caught him with her talons, but his coat of mail saved him from her loathsome fingers. Still she clutched him tight, and bore him in her arms to the bottom of the lake. He had no power to use his weapons, though he had courage enough. Water beasts swam after him and battered him with their tusks. Then he saw that he was in a vast hall, where there was no water but a strange unearthly glowing of firelight. At once the fight began, but but the sword would not bite. It failed its master in its in his need. For the first time, its fame broke down. Away Beowulf threw it in anger, trusting to the strength of his hands. He cared nothing for his own life, for he thought but of honor. He seized the witch by the shoulder, and swayed her thus so that she sank to the, on the pavement. Quickly she recovered, and closed in on him. He staggered and fell, worn out, She sat on him and drew her knife to take his life, but his good male coat turned the point. He stood up again, and then truly God had helped him, for he saw among the armor on the wall an old sword of the huge size, the handiwork of giants. He seized it and smote with all his might so that the witch gave up her life. His heart was full of gladness and light, calm and beautiful as that of the sun filled the hall. He scanned the vast chamber 
and saw Grendel lying there, dead. He cut off his head as a trophy for King Hrothgar, whose men the fiend had killed and devoured. Now those men, who were seated on the banks of the pool, watching with Hrothgar, saw that the water was tinged with blood. Then the old men spoke together of the brave Beowulf, saying they feared they would never see him again. The day was waning fast, so they and the king went homeward. Beowulf's men stayed on, sick at heart, gazing at the pool. They longed but did not expect to see their lord and master. Under the depths, Beowulf was making his way to them. The magic sword melted in his hand, like snow in sunshine. Only the hilt remained, so venomous was the fiend that had been slain therewith. He brought nothing more with him than the hilt and Grendel's head. Up he rose through the waters, where the furious sea beasts had chased them. Now not one was to be seen. The depths were purified when the witch lost her life. So he came to land, bravely swimming, bearing his spoils. His men saw him. They thanked God and ran to free him of his armor. They rejoiced to get sight of him, sound and whole. Now they marched gladly through the highways to the town. It took four of them to carry Grendel's head. On they went, all fourteen, their captain glorious in their midst. They entered the great hall, startling the king and queen as they sat at meat, with the fearful sight of Grendel's head. Beowulf handed the magic hilt to Hrothgar, who saw that it was the work of giants of old. He spake to Beowulf, while all held their peace, praised him for his courage, said he would love him as his son, and bade him to help to mankind, remembering not to glory in his own strength, for he held it from God, and death without more ado might subdue it altogether. Many, many treasures, he said, must pass from me to you tomorrow, but now rest and feast. Gladly, Beowulf sat down to the banquet, and well he liked the thought of the rest. When day dawned, he bade the king farewell with noble words, promising to help him in time of need. Hrothgar with tears and embraces let him go, giving him fresh gifts of hoarded jewels. He wept, for he loved Beowulf well, and he knew he would never see him any more. The coast guard saw the gallant warriors coming, bade them welcome, and led them to their ship. The wind whistled in the sails, and a pleasant humming sound was heard as the good ship sped on her way. So Beowulf returned home, having done mighty deeds and gained great honor. In due time, Beowulf himself became king, and well he governed the land for fifty years. Then trouble came. A slave, fleeing from his master, stumbled by an evil chance into the den of a dragon. There he saw a dazzling hoard of gold, guarded by the dragon for three hundred winters. The treasure tempted him, and he carried off a tankard of gold to give to his master to make peace with him. The dragon had been sleeping. Now he awoke, and sniffed the scent of the enemy along the rock. He hunted diligently over the ground, he wanted to find the man who had done the mischief in his sleep. In his rage, he swung around the treasure mound, thrashing into it. Now and again to seek the jeweled tankard. He found it hard to wait until evening came, when he meant to avenge with fire the loss of his treasure. Presently the sun sank, and the dragon had his will. He set forth, burning all the cheerful homes of men. His rage was felt far and wide. Before dawn, he shot back to, again to his dark home, trusting in his mound and his craft to defend himself. Now Beowulf heard that his own home had been burnt to the ground. It was a great grief to him, almost making him break out in rage against Providence. His breast heaved with anger. He meant to rid his country of the plague, and to fight the dragon single-handed. He would have thought it shame to seek him with a large band. 
He, who as a lad had killed Grendel and his kin. As he armed for the fray, many thoughts filled his mind. He remembered the days of his youth and manhood. I fought many wars in my youth, he said. Now that I am aged and the keeper of my people, I will yet again seek the enemy and do famously. He bade his men await him on the mountainside. They were to see which of the two would come out alive out of the tussle. There the aged king beheld where a rocky archway stood, with a stream of fire gushing from it. No one could stand there and not be scorched. He gave a great shout, and the dragon answered with hot breath of flame. Beowulf, with drawn sword, stood well up to his shield, when the burning dragon, curved like an arch, came headlong upon him. The shield saved him, but little. He swung up the sword to smite the horrible monster, but its edge did not bite. Sparks flew around him on every side. He saw that the end of his days had come. His men crept away from the woods to save their lives. One, and one only, Wiglaf by name, sped through the smoke and flame to help his lord. My lord Beowulf, he cried, with all your might defend life, I will support you to the utmost. The dragon came on in fury. In a trice the flames consumed Wiglaf's shield, but nothing daunted. He stepped under the shelter of Beowulf's as his own fell in ashes about him. The king remembered his strength of old, and he smote with his sword with such force that it stuck in the monster's head, while splinters flew all around. His hand was so strong that, as men used to say, he broke any sword in using it, and was none the worse for it. Now, for the third time, the dragon rushed upon him, and seized him by the neck, with his poisonous fangs. Wiglaf, with no thought for himself, rushed forward, though he was scorched with flames, and smote the dragon lower down than Beowulf had done. With such effect, the sword entered the dragon's body, that from that moment the fire began to cease. The king recovered his senses drew his knife, and ended the monster's life. So these two together destroyed the enemy of the people. To Beowulf, that was the greatest moment of his life, when he saw his work completed. The wound that the dragon had given him began to burn and swell, for the poison had entered it. He knew that the tale of his days was told. As he rested on a stone by the mound, he pondered thoughtfully, looking on the cunning work of the dwarves of old. The stone arches on their rocky pillars. Wiglaf with tender care unloosed his helmet and brought him water, Beowulf discoursing the while. Now I would gladly give up my armor to my son, had God granted me one. I have ruled this people fifty years, and no king has dared attack them. I have held my own with justice, and no friend has lost his life through me. Though I am sick with deadly wounds, I have comfort in this. Go now, quickly, beloved Wiglaf. Show me the ancient wealth that I have won for my people, the gold and brilliant gems, that I may contentedly give up my life. Quickly did Wiglaf enter the mound, at the bidding of his master. On every side he saw gold and jewels and choice vases, helmets and bracelets, and overhead a mysterious banner, all golden, gleaming with light, so that he could scan the surface of the floor and see the curious treasured hoards. He filled his lap with golden cups and platters, also took the brilliant banner. He hastened to return with his spoils, wondering with pain if he should find his king still alive. He bore his treasures to him, laid them on the ground, and again sprinkling him with water. I thank God, said the dying king, that I have been permitted to win this treasure for my people. Now they will have all they need, but I cannot be any longer here. Bid my men make a lofty mound on the headland overlooking the sea, and there place my ashes. In time to come, men shall call it Beowulf's Barrow. It shall tower aloft to guide sailors over the stormy seas. The brave king took from his neck his golden collar, 
took his helmet and his coronet, and gave them to his true knight, Wiglaf. Fate has swept all my kinsmen away, he said, and now I must follow them. That was his last word, as his soul departed from his bosom, to join the company of the just. Of all the kings in the world, he was, said his men, the gentlest to his knights, and the most desirous of honor. End of story. Recorded by Henry Fregon on August 14th, 2008. San Diego, California. The Cat That Walked By Himself by Rudyard Kipling This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or how to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Cat That Walked By Himself by Rudyard Kipling Hear and attend and listen, for this befell, and behappened, and became, and was, O oh, my best beloved, when the tame animals were wild. The dog was wild, and the horse was wild, and the cow was wild, and the sheep was wild, and the pig was wild, as wild as wild could be. And they walked in the wet wild woods by their wild loans. But the wildest of all the wild animals was the cat. He walked by himself, and all places were alike to him. Of course the man was wild too. He was dreadfully wild. He didn't even begin to tame till he met the woman, and she told him that she did not like living in his wild ways. She picked out a nice dry cave, instead of a heap of wet leaves to lie down in, and she strewed clean sand on the floor, and she lit a nice fire of wood at the back of the cave, and she hung a dried wild horse skin, tail down, across the opening of the cave, and she said, Wipe your feet, dear, when you come in, and now we'll keep house. That night, best beloved, they ate wild sheep roasted on the hot stones, and flavored with wild garlic and wild pepper, and wild ducks stuffed with wild rice, and wild fenugreek, and wild coriander, and marrow bones of wild oxen, and wild cherries, and wild grenadillas. Then the man went to sleep in front of the fire, ever so happy. But the woman sat up, combing her hair. She took the bone of the shoulder of mutton, the big fat blade bone, and she looked at the wonderful marks on it, and she threw more wood on the fire, and she made a magic. She made the first singing magic in the world. Out in the wet wild woods, all the wild animals gathered together, where they could see the light of the fire a long way off, and they wondered what it meant. Then Wild Horse stamped with his wild foot, and said, O oh, my friends, and O oh, my enemies, why have the man and the woman made that great light in that great cave, and what harm will it do us? Wild Dog lifted up his wild nose, and smelled the smell of roast mutton, and said, I will go up and see, and look, and say, for I think it is good. Cat, come with me. Nenny, said the cat, I am the cat who walks by himself, and all places are alike to me. I will not come. Then we can never be friends again, said Wild Dog, and he trotted off to the cave. But when he had gone a little way, the cat said to himself, All places are alike to me. Why should I not go too, and see, and look, and come away at my own liking? So he slipped after the wild dog softly, very softly, and hid himself where he could hear everything. When wild dog reached the mouth of the cave, he lifted up the dried horse skin with his nose, and sniffed the beautiful smell of the roast mutton, and the woman, looking at the blade bone, heard him, and laughed, and said, Here comes the first wild thing out of the wild woods. What do you want? Wild Dog said, 
O oh, my enemy, and wife of my enemy, what is this that smells so good in the wild woods? Then the woman picked up a roasted mutton bone and threw it to Wild Dog, and said, Wild thing out of the wild woods, taste and try. Wild Dog gnawed the bone, and it was more delicious than anything he had ever tasted, and he said, O oh, my enemy, and wife of my enemy, give me another. The woman said, Wild thing, out of the wild woods, help my man to hunt through the day, and guard this cave at night, and I will give you as many roast bones as you need. Ah, said the cat, listening, this is a very wise woman, but she is not so wise as I am. Wild Dog crawled into the cave, and laid his head on the woman's lap, and said, O oh, my friend, and wife of my friend, I will help your man to hunt through the day, and at night I will guard your cave. Ah, said the cat, listening, that is a very foolish dog. And he went back through the wet wild woods, waving his wild tail, and walking by his wild lone but he never told anybody. When the man waked up, he said, What is Wild Dog doing here? And the woman said, His name is not Wild Dog any more, but the first friend, because he will be our friend for always and always and always. Take him with you when you go hunting. Next night the woman cut great green armfuls of fresh grass from the water meadows, and dried it before the fire, so that it smelt like new-mown hay. And she sat at the mouth of the cave, and plaited a halter out of horsehide, and she looked at the shoulder of mutton-bone, at the big broad-blade bone, and she made a magic. She made the second singing magic in the world. Out in the wild woods, all the wild animals wondered what had happened to wild dog, and at last Wild Horse stamped with his foot and said, I will go and see and say why Wild Dog has not returned. Cat, come with me. Nenny, said the cat, I am the cat who walks by himself, and all places are alike to me. I will not come. But all the same he followed Wild Horse softly, very softly, and hid himself where he could hear everything. When the woman heard Wild Horse tripping and stumbling on his long mane, she laughed and said, Here comes the second. Wild thing out of the wild woods, what do you want? Wild Horse said, O oh, my enemy and wife of my enemy, where is Wild Dog? The woman laughed and picked up the blade bone and looked at it and said, Wild thing out of the woods. You did not come here for Wild Dog, but for the sake of this good grass. And Wild Horse, tripping and stumbling on his long mane, said, That is true. Give it me to eat. The woman said, Wild thing out of the wild woods, bend your wild head, and wear what I give you, and you shall eat the wonderful grass three times a day. Ah, said the cat listening. This is a clever woman, but she is not so clever as I am. Wild Horse bent his wild head, and the woman slipped the plated hide halter over it, and Wild Horse breathed on the woman's and Wild Horse breathed on the woman's feet and said, O oh, my mistress, and wife of my master, I will be your servant for the sake of the wonderful grass. Ah, said the cat, listening, that is a very foolish horse and he went back through the wet wide and he went back through the wet wild woods waving his wild tail and walking by his wild loan but he never told anybody when the man and the dog came back from hunting the man said what is wild horse doing here and the woman said his name is not wild horse any more but the first servant, because he will carry us from place to place for always and always and always. Ride on his back when you go hunting. 
Next day, holding her wild head high, that her wild horn should not catch in the wild trees, Wild Cow came up to the cave, and the cat followed, and hid himself just the same as before, and everything happened just the same as before, and the cat said the same things as before, and when Wild Cow had promised to give her milk to the woman every day in exchange for the wonderful grass, the cat went back through the wet wild woods, waving his wild tail and walking by his wild lone, just the same as before. But he never told anybody. And when the man and the horse and the dog came home from hunting and asked the same questions, same as before, the woman said, Her name is not Wild Cow any more, but the giver of good food. She will give us the warm white milk for always and always and always, and I will take care of her while you and the first friend and the first servant go hunting. Next day, the cat waited to see if any other wild thing would go up to the cave, but no one moved in the wet wild woods, so the cat walked there by himself, and he saw the woman milking the cow, and he saw the light of the fire in the cave, and he smelt the smell of the warm white milk. Cat said, O oh, my enemy, and wife of my enemy, where did wild cow go? The woman laughed and said, Wild thing, out of the wild woods, go back to the woods again, for I have braided up my hair, and I have put away the magic blade bone, and we have no more need of either friends or servants in our cave. Cat said, I am not a friend, and I am not a servant. I am the cat who walks by himself, and I wish to come into your cave. Woman said, then why did you not come with the first friend on the first night? Cat grew very angry and said, Has Wild Dog told tales of me? Then the woman laughed and said, You are the cat who walks by himself, and all places are alike to you. You are neither a friend nor a servant. You have said it yourself. Go away and walk by yourself in all places alike. Then the cat pretended to be sorry, and said, Must I never come into the cave? Must I never sit by the warm fire? Must I never drink the warm white milk? You are very wise and very beautiful. You should not be cruel, even to a cat. Woman said, I knew I was wise, but I did not know I was beautiful. So I will make a bargain with you. If ever I say one word in your praise, you may come into the cave. And if you say two words in my praise, said the cat. I never shall, said the woman. But if I say two words in your praise, you may sit by the fire in the cave. And if you say three words, said the cat. I never shall, said the woman. But if I say three words in your praise, you may drink the warm white milk three times a day, for always and always and always. Then the cat arched his back and said, Now let the curtain at the mouth of the cave, and the fire at the back of the cave, and the milk pots that stand beside the fire, remember what my enemy and the wife of my enemy has said. And he went away through the wet wild woods, waving his wild tail, and walking by his wild lone. That night, when the man and the horse and the dog came home from hunting, the woman did not tell them of the bargain that she had made with the cat, because she was afraid that they might not like it. Cat went far and far away, and hid himself in the wet wild woods by his wild lone for a long time, till the woman forgot all about him. Only the bat, the little upside-down bat, that hung inside the cave, knew where Cat lived, and every evening Bat would fly to Cat with news of what was happening. One evening Bat said, There is a baby in the cave. He is new and pink and fat and small, and the woman is very fond of him. Ah, said the Cat, listening, but what is the baby fond of? 
he is fond of things that are soft and tickle said the bat he is fond of warm things to hold in his arms when he goes to sleep he is fond of being played with he is fond of all those things ah said the cat listening then my time has come next night cat walked through the wet wild woods and hid very near the cave till morning time and man and dog and horse went hunting the woman was busy cooking that morning and the baby cried and interrupted so she carried him outside the cave and gave him a handful of pebbles to play with but still the baby cried then the cat put out his patty paw and patted the baby on the cheek and it cooed and the cat rubbed against its fat knees and tickled it under its fat chin with with his tail and the baby laughed and the woman heard him and smiled then the bat the little upside-down bat that hung in the mouth of the cave said o oh, my hostess and wife of my host and mother of my host's son a wild thing from the wild woods is most beautifully playing with your baby a blessing on that wild thing whoever he may be said the woman straightening her back for i was a busy woman this morning and he has done me a service that very minute and second best beloved the dried horse skin curtain that was stretched tail down at the mouth of the cave fell down whoosh because it remembered the bargain she had made with the cat and when the woman went to pick it up lo and behold the cat was sitting quite comfy inside the cave oh my enemy and wife of my enemy and mother of my enemy said the cat it is i for you have spoken a word in my praise and now i can sit within the cave for always and always and always but still i am the cat who walks by himself and all places are all alike to me the woman was very angry and shut her lips tight and took up her spinning wheel and began to spin but the baby cried because the cat had gone away and the woman could not hush it for it struggled and kicked and grew black in the face oh my enemy and wife of my enemy and mother of my enemy said the cat take a strand of the wire that you are spinning and tie it to your spinning whirl and drag it along the floor and i will show you a magic that shall make your baby laugh as loudly as he is now crying i will do so said the woman because i am at wit's end but i will not thank you for it she tied the thread to the little clay spindle whorl and drew it across the floor and the cat ran after it and patted it with his paws and rolled head over heels and tossed it backward over his shoulder and chased it between his hind legs and pretended to lose it and pounced down upon it again till the baby laughed as loudly as it had been crying and scrambled after the cat and frolicked all over the cave till it grew tired and settled down to sleep with the cat in its arms now said the cat i will sing the baby a song that shall keep him asleep for an hour and he began to purr loud and low low and loud till the baby fell fast asleep the woman smiled as she looked down upon the two of them and said that was wonderfully done no question but you are very clever o oh cat that very minute and second best beloved the smoke of the fire at the back of the cave came down in clouds from the roof puff because it remembered the bargain she had made with the cat and when it had cleared away lo and behold the cat was sitting quite comfy close to the fire o oh, my enemy and wife of my enemy and mother of my enemy said the cat it is i for you have spoken a second word in my praise and now i can sit by the warm fire at the back of the cave for always and always and always but still i am the cat who walks by himself and all places are all alike to me then the woman was very very angry and let down her hair and put more wood on the fire and brought out the broad blade bone of the shoulder of mutton and began to make a magic 
that should prevent her from saying a third word in praise of the cat. It was not a singing magic, best beloved. It was a still magic. And by and by the cave grew so still that a little wee-wee mouse crept out of a corner and ran across the floor. Oh, my enemy, and wife of my enemy, and mother of my enemy, said the cat, is that little mouse part of your magic? Oh, gee, no indeed, said the woman, and she dropped the blade bone and jumped upon the footstool in front of the fire and braided up her hair very quick for fear that the mouse should run up it. Ah, said the cat, watching, then the mouse will do me no harm if I eat it. No, said the woman, braiding up her hair, eat it quickly, and I will ever be grateful to you. Cat made one jump and caught the little mouse, and the woman said, A hundred thanks. Even the first friend is not quick enough to catch little mice as you have done. You must be very wise. That very moment and second, oh, best beloved, the milk pot that stood by the fire cracked in two pieces, because it remembered the bargain she had made with the cat, and when the woman jumped down from the footstool, lo and behold, the cat was lapping up the warm white milk that lay in one of the broken pieces. O oh, my enemy, and wife of my enemy, and mother of my enemy, said the cat, it is I, for you have spoken three words in my praise, and now I can drink the warm white milk three times a day, for always, and always, and always. But still I am the cat who walks by himself, and all places are alike to me. Then the woman laughed, and set the cat a bowl of the warm white milk, and said, O oh, cat, you are as clever as a man, but remember that your bargain was not made with the man or the dog, and I do not know what they will do when they come home. What is that to me? said the cat. If I have my place in the cave by the fire, and my warm white milk three times a day, I do not care what the man or the dog can do. That evening, when the man and the dog came into the cave, the woman told them all the story of the bargain, while the cat sat by the fire and smiled. Then the man said, Yes, but he has not made a bargain with me, or with all proper men after me. Then he took off his two leather boots, and he took up his little stone axe, that makes three, and he fetched a piece of wood and a hatchet, that is five altogether, and he set them out in a row, and he said, Now we will make our bargain. If you do not catch mice when you are in the cave for always and always and always, I will throw these five things at you whenever I see you, and so shall all proper men do after me. Ah, said the woman, listening, this is a very clever cat, but he is not so clever as my man. The cat counted the five things, and they looked very knobby. And he said, I will catch mice when I am in the cave for always and always and always, but still I am the cat who walks by himself, and all places are alike to me. Not when I am near, said the man. If you had not said that last, I would have put all these things away for always and always and always, but I am now going to throw my two boots and my little stone axe that makes three, at you whenever I meet you, and so shall all proper men do after me. Then the dog said, Wait a minute, he has not made a bargain with me, or with all proper dogs after me. And he showed his teeth, and said, If you are not kind to the baby while I am in the cave for always and always and always, I will hunt you till I catch you, and when I catch you I will bite you, and so shall all proper dogs do after me. Ah, said the woman, listening, this is a very clever cat, but he is not so clever as the dog. Cat counted the dog's teeth, and they looked very pointed. And he said, 
I will be kind to the baby while I am in the cave, as long as he does not pull my tail too hard, for always, and always, and always. But still, I am the cat that walks by himself, and all places are alike to me. Not when I am near, said the dog. If you had not said that last, I would have shut my mouth for always, and always, and always. But now I am going to hunt you up a tree whenever I meet you, and so shall all proper dogs do after me. Then the man threw his two boots and his little stone axe, that makes three, at the cat, and the cat ran out of the cave, and the dog chased him up a tree, and from that day to this, best beloved, three proper men out of five will always throw things at a cat whenever they meet him, and all proper dogs will chase him up a tree. But the cat keeps his side of the bargain, too. He will kill mice, and he will be kind to babies when he is in the house, just as long as they do not pull his tail too hard. But when he has done that, and between times, and when the moon gets up and night comes, he is the cat that walks by himself, and all places are all alike to him. Then he goes out to the wet wild woods, or up the wet wild trees, or on the wet wild roofs, waving his wild tail, and walking by his wild lone. Pussy can sit by the fire and sing, Pussy can climb a tree, Or play with a silly old cork and string, To muse herself, not me. But I like Binky my dog, Because he knows how to behave. So Binky's the same as the first friend was, And I am the man of the cave. Pussy will play Man Friday till it's time to wet her paw, and make her walk on the window sill for the footprint Crusoe saw. Then she fluffles her tail and mews, and scratches and won't attend. But Binky will play whatever I choose, and he is my true first friend. Pussy will rub my knees with her head, pretending she loves me hard. But the very minute I go to my bed, Pussy runs out in the yard, and there she stays till the morning light, so I know it's only pretend, but Binky, he snores at my feet all night, and he is my finest friend. End of The Cat That Walked By Himself by Rudyard Kipling The Gift of the Magi by O. Henry. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rhonda Fetterman. The Gift of the Magi by O. Henry. One dollar and eighty-seven cents. That was all. And sixty cents of it was in pennies. Penny saved one and two at a time by bulldozing the grocer and the vegetable man and the butcher until one's cheeks burned with the silent imputation of parsimony that such close dealing implied. Three times Della counted it. One dollar and eighty-seven cents. And the next day would be Christmas. There was clearly nothing to do but flop down on the shabby little couch and howl. So Della did it, which instigates the moral reflection that life is made up of sobs, sniffles, and smiles, with sniffles predominating. While the mistress of the home is gradually subsiding from the first stage to the second, take a look at the home. A furnished flat at eight dollars per week. It did not exactly beggar description but it certainly had that word on the lookout for the mendicancy squad. In the vestibule below was a letter-box into which no letter would go, and an electric button from which no mortal finger could coax a ring. Also appertaining thereunto was a card bearing the name Mr. James Dillingham Young. The Dillingham had been flung to the breeze during a former period of prosperity, when its possessor was being paid thirty dollars per week. Now, when the income was shrunk to twenty dollars, though, they were thinking seriously of contracting to a modest and unassuming 
D. But whenever Mr. James Dillingham Young came home and reached his flat above, he was called Jim, and greatly hugged by Mrs. James Dillingham Young, already introduced to you as Della, which is all very good. Della finished her cry and attended to her cheeks with the powder rag. She stood by the window and looked out dully at a gray cat walking a gray fence in a gray backyard. Tomorrow would be Christmas Day, and she had only one dollar and eighty-seven cents with which to buy Jim a present. She had been saving every penny she could for months, with this result. Twenty dollars a week doesn't go far. Expenses had been greater than she had calculated. They always are. Only one dollar and eighty-seven cents to buy a present for Jim, her Jim. Many a happy hour she had spent planning for something nice for him, something fine and rare and sterling, something just a little bit near to being worthy of the honor of being owned by Jim. There was a pier glass between the windows of the room. Perhaps you have seen a pier glass in an eight-dollar flat. A very thin and very agile person may, by observing his reflection in a rapid sequence of longitudinal strips, obtain a fairly accurate conception of his looks. Della, being slender, had mastered the art. Suddenly she whirled from the window and stood before the glass. Her eyes were shining brilliantly, but her face had lost its color within twenty seconds. Rapidly she pulled down her hair and let it fall to its full length. Now there were two possessions of the James Dillingham Youngs in which they both took a mighty pride. One was Jim's gold watch that had been his father's and his grandfather's. The other was Della's hair. Had the Queen of Sheba lived in the flat across the air shaft, Della would have let her hair hang out the window some day to dry just to depreciate Her Majesty's jewels and gifts. Had King Solomon been the janitor, with all his treasures piled up in the basement, Jim would have pulled out his watch every time he passed, just to see him pluck at his beard from envy. So now Della's beautiful hair fell about her rippling and shining like a cascade of brown waters. It reached below her knee and made itself almost a garment for her. And then she did it up again nervously and quickly. Once she faltered for a minute and stood still while a tear or two splashed on the worn red carpet. On went her old brown jacket. On went her old brown hat. With a whirl of skirts and with the brilliant sparkle still in her eyes, she fluttered out the door and down the stairs to the street. Where she stopped, the sign read, Madame Souffroni, hair goods of all kinds. One flight up, Della ran and collected herself, panting. Madame, large, too white, chilly hardly looked the Saffroni. "'Will you buy my hair?' asked Stella. "'I buy hair,' said Madame. "'Take your hat off, and let's have a sight at the looks of it.' Down rippled the brown cascade. Twenty dollars,' said Madame, lifting the mass with a practiced hand. "'Give it to me quick,' said Della. "'Oh, and the next two hours tripped by on rosy wings.' Forget the hashed metaphor. She was ransacking the stores for Jim's present. She found it at last. It surely had been made for Jim and no one else. There was no other like it in any of the stores, and she had turned all of them inside out. It was a platinum fob chain, simple and chaste in design, properly proclaiming its value by substance alone, and not by meretricious ornamentation, as all good things should do. It was even worthy of the watch. As soon as she saw it, she knew it must be Jim's. It was like him. Quietness and value, the description applied to both. 
twenty-one dollars they took from her for it, and she hurried home with the eighty-seven cents. With that chain on his watch, Jim might be properly anxious about the time in any company. Grand as the watch was, he sometimes looked at it on the sly, on account of the old leather strap that he used in place of the chain. When Della reached home, her intoxication gave way a little to prudence and reason. She got out her curling irons and lighted the gas and went to work repairing the ravages made by generosity added to love, which is always a tremendous task, dear friends, a mammoth task. Within forty minutes her head was covered with tiny, close-lying curls that made her look wonderfully like a truant schoolboy. She looked at her reflection in the mirror, long, carefully, and critically. "'If Jim doesn't kill me,' she said to herself, "'before he takes a second look at me, he'll say I look like a Coney Island chorus girl. But what could I do? Oh, what could I do with a dollar and eighty-seven cents?' At seven o'clock the coffee was made and the frying pan was on the back of the stove, hot and ready to cook the chops. Jim was never late. Della doubled the fob chain in her hand and sat on the corner of the table near the door that he always entered. Then she heard his step on the stair away down on the first flight, and she turned white just for a moment. She had a habit of saying a little silent prayer about the simplest everyday things, and now she whispered, "'Please, God, make him think I am still pretty.' The door opened, and Jim stepped in and closed it. He looked thin and very serious. Poor fellow, he was only twenty-two, and to be burdened with a family— he needed a new overcoat, and he was without gloves. Jim stopped inside the door, as immovable as a setter at the scent of quail. His eyes were fixed upon Della, and there was an expression in them that she could not read, and it terrified her. It was not anger, nor surprise, nor disapproval, nor horror, nor any of the sentiments that she had been prepared for. He simply stared at her fixedly, with that peculiar expression on his face. Della wriggled off the table and went for him. "'Jim, darling,' she cried, "'don't look at me that way. I had my hair cut off and sold because I couldn't have lived through Christmas without giving you a present. It'll grow out again. You won't mind, will you? I just had to do it. My hair grows awfully fast.' Say Merry Christmas, Jim, and let's be happy. You don't know what a nice, what a beautiful, nice gift I've got for you. You've cut off your hair? asked Jim laboriously, as if he had not arrived at that patent fact yet, even after the hardest mental labor. Cut it off and sold it, said Della. Don't you like me just as well anyhow? I'm me without my hair. "'Ain't I?' Jim looked about the room curiously. "'You say your hair is gone?' he said, with an air almost of idiocy. "'You needn't look for it,' said Della. "'It's sold, I tell you, sold and gone, too. "'It's Christmas Eve, boy. "'Be good to me, for it went for you. "'Maybe the hairs of my head were numbered,' she went on with sudden serious sweetness." but nobody could ever count my love for you. Shall I put the chops on, Jim? Out of his trance, Jim seemed quickly to wake. He enfolded his Della. For ten seconds, let us regard with discreet scrutiny some inconsequential object in the other direction. Eight dollars a week, or a million a year. What is the difference? A mathematician or a wit would give you the wrong answer. The Magi brought valuable gifts, but that was not among them. This dark assertion will be illuminated later on. Jim drew a package from his overcoat pocket and threw it upon the table. 
"'Don't make any mistake, Dell,' he said, "'about me. I don't think there's anything in the way of a haircut or a shave or a shampoo that could make me like my girl any less. But if you'll unwrap the package, you may see why you had me going a while at first. White fingers and nimble tore at the string and paper, and then an ecstatic scream of joy, and then, alas, a quick feminine change to hysterical tears and wails, necessitating the immediate employment of all the comforting powers of the lord of the flat. For there lay the combs, the set of combs, side and back, that Della had worshipped long in a Broadway window. Beautiful combs, pure tortoise shell, with jeweled rims, just the shade to wear in the beautiful vanished hair. They were expensive combs, she knew, and her heart had simply craved and yearned over them without the least hope of possession. And now they were hers, but the tresses that should have adorned the coveted adornments were gone. But she hugged them to her bosom, and at length she was able to look up with dim eyes and smile and say, "'My hair grows so fast, Jim.' And then Della leaped up like a singed cat and cried, Oh, oh! Jim had not yet seen his beautiful present. She held it out to him eagerly upon her open palm. The dull, precious metal seemed to flash with a reflection of her bright and ardent spirit. Isn't it a dandy, Jim? I hunted all over town to find it. You'll have to look at the time a hundred times a day now. Give me your watch. I want to see how it looks on it. Instead of obeying, Jim tumbled down on the couch and put his hands under the back of his head and smiled. Dell, he said, let's put our Christmas presents away and keep them a while. They're too nice to use just at present. I sold the watch to get the money to buy your combs. And now... Suppose you put the chops on. The Magi, as you know, were wise men, wonderfully wise men, who brought gifts to the babe in the manger. They invented the art of giving Christmas presents. Being wise, their gifts were no doubt wise ones, possibly bearing the privilege of exchange in case of duplication and here I have lamely related to you the uneventful chronicle of two foolish children in a flat who most unwisely sacrificed for each other the greatest treasures of their house. But in a last word to the wise of these days, let it be said that of all who give gifts, these two were the wisest. Of all who give and receive gifts such as they are the wisest. Everywhere they are wisest. They are the Magi. End of Gift of the Magi Recording by Rhonda Fetterman The Messengers by Richard Harding Davis This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ambrosius 16. The Messengers by Richard Harding Davis. When Ainsley first moved to Lone Lake Farm, all of his friends asked him the same question. They wanted to know if the farmer who sold it to him had abandoned it as worthless how one of the idle rich, who could not distinguish a plough from a harrow, hoped to make it pay. His answer was that he had not purchased the farm as a means of getting richer by honest toil, but as a retreat from the world and as a test of true friendship. He argued that the people he knew accepted his hospitality at Sherry's because, in any event, they themselves would be dining within a taxicab fare of the same place. But if to see him they travelled all the way to Lone Lake Farm, he might feel assured that they were friends indeed. Lone Lake Farm was spread over many acres of rocky ravine and forest, at a point where Connecticut approaches New York, 
and between it and the nearest railroad station stretched six miles of an execrable wood road. In this wilderness, directly upon the lonely lake, and at a spot equally distant from each of his boundary lines, Ainsley built himself a red brick house. Here in solitude he exiled himself, ostensibly to become a gentleman farmer, in reality to wait until Polly Kirkland had made up her mind to marry him. Lone Lake, which gave the farm its name, was a pond hardly larger than a city block. It was fed by hidden springs and fringed about with reeds and cattails, stunted willows and shivering birch. From its surface jutted points of the same rock that had made farming unremunerative. And to these miniature promontories and islands Ainsley, in keeping with a fancied resemblance, gave such names as the Needles, St. Helena, the Isle of Pines. From the edge of the pond that was farther up from the house rose a high hill heavily wooded. At its base oak and chestnut trees spread their branches over the water, and when the air was still were so clearly reflected in the pond that the leaves seemed to float upon the surface. To the smiling expanse of the farm the lake was what the eye is to the human countenance. The oaks were its eyebrows, the fringe of reeds its lashes, and, in changing mood, it flashed with happiness or brooded in sombre melancholy. For Ainsley it held a deep attraction. Through the summer evenings, as the sun set, he would sit on the brick terrace and watch the fish leaping, and listen to the venerable bullfrogs croaking false alarms of rain. Indeed, after he met Polly Kirkland, staring moodily at the lake became his favorite form of exercise. With a number of other men, Ainsley was very much in love with Miss Kirkland, and unprejudiced friends thought that if she were to choose any of her devotees, Ainsley should be that one. Ainsley heartily agreed in this opinion, but in persuading Miss Kirkland to share it, he had not been successful. This was partly his own fault, for when he dared to compare what she meant to him with what he had to offer her, he became a mass of sodden humility. Could he have known how much Polly Kirkland envied and admired his depth of feeling? Entirely apart from the fact that she herself inspired that feeling, how greatly she wished to care for him in the way he cared for her, life, even alone in the silences of Lone Lake, would have been a beautiful and blessed thing. But he was so sure she was the most charming and wonderful girl in all the world, and he an unworthy and despicable being, that when the lady demurred, he faltered, and his pleading, at least to his own ears, carried no conviction. "'When one thinks of being married,' said Polly Kirkland gently, "'it isn't a question of the man you can live with, but the man you can't live without. "'And I'm sorry, but I've not found that man.' "'I suppose,' returned Ainsley gloomily, "'that my not being able to live without you doesn't affect the question in the least.' "'You have lived without me,' Miss Kirkland pointed out reproachfully, "'for thirty years.' "'Lived!' almost shouted Ainsley. "'Do you call that living? "'What was I before I met you? "'I was an ignorant beast of the field. "'I knew as much about living as one of the cows on my farm. "'I could sleep twelve hours at a stretch, "'or, if I was in New York, I never slept. "'I was a day and night bank of health and happiness.' a great big useless puppy, and now I can't sleep, can't eat, can't think, except of you. I dream about you all night, think about you all day, go through the woods calling your name, cutting your initials in tree trunks, doing all the fool things a man does when he's in love, and I'm the most miserable man in the world, and the happiest. He finally succeeded in making Miss Kirkland so miserable, also, that she decided to run away. Friends had planned to spend the entire spring on the Nile, and were eager that she should accompany them. To her, the separation seemed to offer an excellent method of discovering whether or not Ainsley was a man she could not live without. Ainsley saw in it only an act of torture, devised with devilish cruelty. "'What will happen to me,' he announced firmly, "'is that I will plain die. "'As long as I can see you, "'as long as I have the chance to try and make you understand "'that no one can possibly love you as I do, "'and as long as I know I am worrying you to death, 
and no one else is, I still hope. I've no right to hope, still I do. And that one little chance keeps me alive. But Egypt? If you escape to Egypt, what hold will I have on you? You might as well be in the moon. Can you imagine me writing love letters to a woman in the moon? Can I send American Beauty roses to the ruins of Karnak? Here I can telephone you, not that I ever have anything to say that you want to hear, but because I want to listen to your voice and to have you ask, Oh, is that you? As though you were glad it was me. But Egypt, can I call up Egypt on the long distance? If you leave me now, you will leave me forever, for I'll drown myself in Lone Lake. The day she sailed away, he went to the steamer, and, separating her from her friends and family, drew her to the side of the ship farther from the wharf, and which, for the moment, was deserted. Directly below a pile-driver, with rattling of chains and shrieks from her donkey engine, was smashing great logs. On the deck above, the ship's band was braying forth fictitious gaiety, and from every side they were assailed by the raucous whistles of ferry-boats. The surroundings were not conductive to sentiment, but for the first time Polly Kirkland seemed a little uncertain, a little frightened. Almost on the verge of tears, almost persuaded to surrender. For the first time she laid her hand on Ainsley's arm, and the shock sent the blood to his heart and held him breathless. When the girl looked at him there was something in her eyes that neither he nor any other man had ever seen there. "'The last thing I tell you,' she said, the thing I want you to remember is this, that, though I do not care, I want to care. Ainsley caught at her hand, and to the delight of the crew of a passing tugboat, kissed it rapturously. His face was radiant. The fact of parting from her had caused him real suffering, and marked his face with hard lines. Now, hope and happiness smoothed them away, and his eyes shone with his love for her. He was trembling, laughing, jubilant. "'And if you should,' he begged, "'how soon will I know?' "'You will cable,' he commanded. "'You will cable. Come, and the same hour I'll start toward you. "'I'll go home now,' he cried, "'and pack.' The girl drew away. Already she regretted the admission she had made. In fairness and in kindness to him, she tried to regain the position she had abandoned." But a change like that, she pleaded, might not come for years, may never come. To recover herself, to make the words she had uttered seem less serious, she spoke quickly and lightly. And how could I cable such a thing? she protested. It would be far too scared, too precious. You should be able to feel that the change has come. I suppose I should, assented Ainsley doubtfully, but it's a long way across two oceans. It would be safer if you'd promised to use the cable. Just one word. Come. The girl shook her head and frowned. If you can't feel that the woman you love loves you, even across the world, you cannot love her very deeply. I don't have to answer that, said Ainsley. I will send you a sign, continued the girl hastily, a secret wireless message. It shall be a test. If you love me, you will read it at once. You will know the instant you see it that it comes from me. No one else will be able to read it, but if you love me, you will know that I love you. Whether she spoke in metaphor or in fact, whether she was playing for time, or whether in her heart she already intended to soon reward him with a message of glad tidings, Ainsley could not decide. And even as he begged her to enlighten him, the last whistle blew, and a determined officer ordered him to the ship's side. "'Just as in everything that is beautiful,' he whispered eagerly, "'I always see something of you. "'So now, in everything wonderful, I will read your message. "'But,' he persisted, "'how shall I be sure?' "'The last bag of mail had shot into the hold. "'The most reluctant of the visitors "'were being hustled down the last remaining gangplank. "'Ainsley's state was desperate. "'Will it be in symbol or in cipher?' he demanded. "'Must I read it in the sky, or will you hide it in a letter, or where? "'Help me! Give me just a hint!' "'The girl shook her head. 
You will read it in your heart, she said. From the end of the wharf, Ainsley watched the funnels of the ship disappear in the haze of the lower bay. His heart was sore and heavy, but in it there was still room for righteous indignation. "'Read it in my heart,' he protested. "'How the devil can I read it in my heart? I want to read it printed in a cablegram.' Because he had always understood that young men fell in love, found solace for their mystery in solitude and in communion with nature— he at once drove his car to Lone Lake. But his misery was quite genuine, and the emptiness of the brick house only served to increase his loneliness. He had built the house for her, though she had never visited it, and was associated with it only through the somewhat indefinite medium of the telephone box. But in New York they had been much together, and Ainsley quickly decided that in revisiting those places where he had been happy in her company, he would derive from the recollection some melancholy consolation. He accordingly raced back through the night to the city, nor did he halt until he was at the door of her house. She had left it only that morning, and though it was locked in darkness, it still spoke of her. At least it seemed to bring her nearer to him than when he was listening to the frogs in the lake and crushing his way through the pines. He was not hungry, but he went to a restaurant where, when he was host, she had often been the honoured guest, and he pretended they were at supper together and without a chaperone. Either the illusion or the supper cheered him, for he was encouraged to go on to his club. There in the library, with the aid of an atlas, he worked out where, after thirteen hours of moving at the rate of twenty-two knots an hour, she should be at that moment. Having determined that fact to his own satisfaction, he sent a wireless after the ship, it read, It is now midnight, and you are in latitude 40 degrees north, longitude 68 degrees west, and I have grown old and gray waiting for the sign. The next morning, and for many days after, he was surprised to find that the city went on as though she were still in it. With unfeeling regularity, the sun rose out of the East River. On Broadway, electric light signs flashed. Street cars pursued each other. Taxicabs bumped and skidded. Women, and even men, dared to look happy, and had apparently taken some thought to their attire. They did not respect even his widowerhood. They smiled upon him and asked him jocularly about the farm and his crops, and what he was doing in New York. He pitied them, for obviously they were ignorant of the fact that in New York there were art galleries, shops, restaurants of great interest, owing to the fact that Polly Kirkland had visited them. They did not know that on Upper Fifth Avenue were houses of which she had designed to approve, or which she had destroyed with ridicule, and that to walk that avenue and halt before each of these houses was an inestimable privilege. Each day, with pathetic vigilance, Ainsley examined his heart for the promised sign. But so far, from telling him that the change he longed for had taken place, his heart grew heavier. And as weeks went by and no sign appeared, what little confidence he had once enjoyed passed with them. But before hope entirely died, several fa false alarms had thrilled him with happiness. One was a cablegram from Gibraltar in which the only words that were intelligible— were congratulate and engagement. This lifted him into an ecstasy of joy and excitement, until, on having the cable company repeat the message, he learned it was a request from Miss Kirkland to congratulate two mutual friends who had just announced their engagement, and of whose address she was uncertain. He had hardly recovered from this disappointment that he was again thrown into a tumult by the receipt of a mysterious package from the custom house containing an intaglio ring. The ring came from Italy, and her ship had touched at Genoa. The fact that it was addressed in an unknown handwriting did not disconcert him, for he argued that to make the test more difficult she might disguise the handwriting. He at once carried the intaglio to an expert at the Metropolitan Museum, and when he was told that it represented Cupid feeding a fire upon an altar, he reserved a stateroom on the first steamer bound for Mediterranean. But before his ship sailed, a letter, also from Italy, from his Aunt Maria, 
who was spending the winter in Rome, informed him that the ring was a Christmas gift from her. In his rage he unjustly condemned Aunt Maria as a meddling old busybody, and gave her ring to the cook. After two months of pilgrimages to places sacred to the memory of Polly Kirkland, Ainsley found that feeding his love and post-mortems was poor fare, and, in surrender, determined to evacuate New York. Since her departure he had received from Miss Kirkland several letters, but they contained no hint of a change in her affections, and search them as he might he could find no cipher or hidden message. They were merely frank, friendly notes of travel at first filled with gossip of the steamer, and later telling of excursions around Cairo. If they held any touch of feeling, they seemed to show that she was sorry for him, and if she could not regard him in any way more calculated to increase his discouragement, he, in utter hopelessness, retreated to the solitude of the farm. In New York he left behind him two trunks filled with such garments as a man would need on board a steamer, and in the early spring in Egypt. They had been packed and in readiness since the day she sailed away, when she had told him of the possible sign. But there had been no sign. Nor did he longer believe in one. So, in the baggage room of an old hotel, the trunks were abandoned, accumulating layers of dust and charges for storage. At the farm the snow still lay in the crevices of the rocks and beneath the branches of the evergreens, but under the wet dead leaves little flowers had begun to show their faces. The backbone of the winter was broken, and spring was in the air. But as Ainsley was certain that his heart was also broken, the signs of spring did not console him. At each weekend he filled the house with people, but they found him gloomy and he found them dull. He liked better the solitude of the midweek days. Then, for hours, he would tramp through the woods, pretending she was at his side, pretending he was helping her across the stream swollen with winter rains and melted snow. On these excursions he cut down trees that hid a view he thought she would have liked. He cut paths over which she might have walked, or he sat idly in a flat-bottomed scow in the lake and made a pretense of fishing. The loneliness of the lake and the isolation of the boat suited his humor. He did not find it true that misery loves company. At least to human beings he preferred his companions of Lone Lake, the beaver building his home among the reeds, the kingfisher, the blue heron, the wild fowl that in their flight north rested for an hour or day upon the peaceful waters. He looked upon them as his guests and when they spread their wings and left him again alone, he felt he had been hardly used. It was while he was sunk in the state of melancholy, and some months after Miss Kirkland had sailed to Egypt, that hope returned. For a weekend he had invited Holden and Lowell, two former classmates, and Nelson Mortimer and his bride. They were all old friends of their host and well acquainted with the cause of his discouragement. So they did not ask to be entertained, but disregarding him amused themselves after their own fashion. It was late Friday afternoon. The members of the house party had just returned from a tramp through the woods and had joined Ainsley on the terrace, where he stood watching the last rays of the sun leave the lake in darkness. All through the day there had been sharp splashes of rain with the clouds dull and forbidding, but now the sun was sinking in a sky of crimson and for the morrow a faint moon held out a promise of fair weather. Elsie Mortimer gave a sudden exclamation and pointed to the coast. Look, she said. The men turned and followed the direction of her hand. In the fading light against a background of somber clouds that the sun could not reach, they saw, moving slowly toward them and descending as they moved, six great white birds. When they were above the tops of the trees that edged the lake, the birds halted, and hovered uncertainly, their wings lifting and falling, their bodies slanting and sweeping, slowly, in short circles. The suddenness of their approach, their presence so far inland, something unfamiliar and foreign in the way they had winged their progress, for a moment held the group upon the terrace silent. "'They are goals from the sound,' said Lowell. "'They are too large for goals,' returned Mortimer. "'They might be well in geese, but—' he answered himself in a puzzled voice. It is too late, and wild geese follow a leader. 
As though they feared the birds might hear them and take alarm, the men unconsciously had spoken in low tones. "'They move as though they were very tired,' whispered Elsie Mortimer. "'I think,' said Ainsley, "'they have lost their way.' But even as he spoke, the birds, as though they had reached their goal, spread their wings to the full length and sank to the shallow water at the farthest margin of the lake. As they fell, the sun struck full upon them, turning their great pinions into flashing white and silver. "'Oh!' cried the girl, "'but they are beautiful!' Between the house and the lake there was a ridge of rock higher than the head of a man, and to this Ainsley and his guests ran for cover. On hands and knees, like hunters stalking game, they scrambled up the face of the rock and peered cautiously into the pond. Below them, less than one hundred yards away, on a tiny promontory, the six white birds stood motionless. They showed no sign of fear. They could not but know that beyond the lonely circle of the pond were the haunts of men. From the farm came the tinkle of a cowbell, the bark of a dog, and in the valley, six miles distant, rose faintly upon the stillness of the sunset hour, the rumble of a passing train. But if these sounds carried, the birds gave no heed. In each drooping head and dragging wind, in the forward stoop of each white body, weighing heavily on the slim black legs, was written utter weariness, abject fatigue. To each even to lower his bill and sip from the cool waters was a supreme effort and in their exhaustion so complete was something humanly helpless and pathetic. To Ainsley the mysterious visitors made a direct appeal. He felt as though they had thrown themselves upon his hospitality. That they showed such confidence that the sanctuary would be kept sacred touched him, and while his friends spoke eagerly he remained silent, watching the drooping, ghost-like figures, his eyes filled with pity. I've seen birds like those in Florida, Mortimer was whispering, but they were not migratory birds. And I've seen white cranes in the Adirondacks, said Lowell, but never six at one time. They're like no bird I ever saw out of a zoo, declared Elsie Mortimer. Maybe they are from the zoo. Maybe they escaped from the Bronx. The Bronx is too near, objected Lowell. These birds have come a great distance. They move as though they had been flying for many days. As though the absurdity of his own thought amused him, Mortimer laughed softly. "'I'll tell you what they do look like,' he said. "'They look like that bird you see on the Nile, the sacred ibis. They—' Something between a gasp and a cry startled him into silence. He found his host staring wildly, his lips parted, his eyes wide open. "'Where?' demanded Ainsley. "'Where did you say?' His voice was so hoarse, so strange, that they all turned and looked. "'On the Nile,' repeated Mortimer. "'All over Egypt. Why?' Ainsley made no answer. Unclasping his hold, he suddenly slid down the face of the rock, and with a bump, lit on his hands and knees. With one bound he had cleared a flower-bed, in two more he had mounted the steps to the terrace, and in another instant had disappeared into the house. "'What happened to him?' demanded Elsie Mortimer. "'He's gone to get a gun!' exclaimed Mortimer. "'But he mustn't! How can he think of shooting them?' he cried indignantly. "'I'll put a stop to that.' In the hall he found Ainsley, surrounded by a group of startled servants. "'You get that car at the door in five minutes!' he was shouting. "'And you, telephone the hotel to have my trunks out of the cellar and on board the Crown Prince Albert by midnight. "'Then you telephone Hoboken that I want a cabin, and if they haven't got a cabin I want the captain's.' "'And tell them anyway I'm coming on board tonight, "'and I'm going with them if I have to sleep on deck. "'And you,' he cried, turning to Mortimer, "'take a shotgun and guard that lake, "'and if anybody tries to molest those birds, shoot him. "'They've come from Egypt, from Polly Kirkland. "'She sent them. They're a sign.' "'Are you going mad?' cried Mortimer. "'No!' roared Ainsley. "'I'm going to Egypt, and I'm going now.' Polly Kirkland and her friends were traveling slowly up the Nile and had reached Luxor. A few hundred yards below the village, their dahabia was moored to the bank, and, on the deck, Miss Kirkland was watching a scarlet sun sink behind two palm trees. By the grace of that special providence that cares for drunken men, citizens of the United States and lovers, her friends were on shore and she was alone. For this she was grateful 
for her thoughts were of a melancholy and tender nature, and she had no wish for any companion save one. In consequence, when a steam launch, approaching at full speed with the rattle of a quick-firing gun, broke upon her meditations, she was distinctly annoyed. But when, with much ringing of bells and shouting of orders, the steam launch rammed the paint off her de Havia, and a young man flung himself over the rail and ran toward her, her annoyance passed, and with a sigh she sank into his outstretched eager arms. Half an hour later Ainsley laughed proudly and happily. "'Well,' he exclaimed, "'you can never say I kept you waiting. I didn't lose much time, did I? Ten minutes after I got your CQD signal, I was going down the Boston Post Road at seventy miles an hour.' "'My what?' said the girl. "'The sign,' explained Ainsley. "'The sign you were to send me to tell me,' he bent over her hands and added gently, "'that you cared for me.' "'Oh, I remember,' laughed Polly Kirkland. "'I was to send you a sign, wasn't I? "'You were to read it in your heart,' she quoted. "'And I did,' returned Ainsley complacently. "'There were several false alarms, and I'd almost lost hope. "'But when the messengers came, I knew them.' "'With puzzled eyes, the girl frowned and raised her head. "'Messengers?' she repeated. "'I sent no message. "'Of course,' she went on, when I said you would read it in your heart, I meant that if you really loved me, you would not wait for a sign, but you would just come. She sighed proudly and contentedly. And you came. You understood that, didn't you? she asked anxiously. For an instant Ainsley stared blankly, and then to hide his guilty countenance drew her toward him and kissed her. Of course, he stammered, of course I understood. That was why I came. I just couldn't stand it any longer. Breathing heavily at the thought of the blunder he had so narrowly avoided, Ainsley turned his head toward the great red disk that was disappearing into the sands of the desert. He was so long silent that the girl lifted her eyes, and found that already he had forgotten her presence, and transfixed was staring at the sky. On his face was bewilderment and wonder and a touch of awe. The girl followed the direction of his eyes, and in the swiftly gathering darkness saw coming slowly toward them, and descending as they came, six great white birds. They moved with the last effort of complete exhaustion. In the drooping head and dragging wings of each was written utter weariness, abject fatigue. For a moment they hovered over the Dahabia and above the two young lovers, and then, like tired travelers, who had reached their journey's end, they spread their wings and sank into the muddy waters of the Nile and into the enveloping night. Some day, said Ainsley, I have a confession to make to you. End of the Messengers Recording by Ambrosius Peter Klaus the Goat Herd by James Baldwin. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kalinda. Peter Klaus the Goat Herd by James Baldwin. In the village of Zittendorf, in Germany, there dwelt a long time ago a poor but worthy man whose name was Peter Klaus. All the people for miles around knew Peter. He was not fond of hard work. He could not have been persuaded for all the money in the world to spend his days in a shop tinkering at a trade. He liked to be out of doors. He liked to wander at his ease in the fields and the woods, enjoying the sunlight and the flowers and the songs of the birds. Since he could not be induced to follow any occupation in the village, his neighbors sometimes hired him to take care of their goats. Every morning he drove a great flock of billies and nannies out upon the slopes of the Kufhäuser mountain, and while they browsed upon the grass he wandered around in the groves and glens or went to sleep on the sunny slope of some great rock. In the evening he got the goats together and drove them slowly back to the village. This was just the kind of life that he liked 
and he wished no grander title than that of Peter Klaus the Goatherd. One morning, soon after reaching the pasture, Peter missed the prettiest nanny goat in the flock. He hunted for her among the rocks and in the thickets of underbrush. He called her. He climbed to the top of the hill, whence he could see all over the country for miles around. But no stray goat could he find. When evening came and it was time to go home, he was in great despair. Should he go home and say that he had lost one of his flock? Such a thing had never happened before. But what was his surprise upon rounding up the flock, to see the lost nanny in its midst? The same thing happened for several days. Every morning nanny would disappear, and nothing could be seen of her until late in the evening, when she would suddenly join her fellows and run, frisking and playing, back to the village. Peter was much puzzled, for do what he could, he was unable to find out what the frolicking creature did with herself during the day. At length he made up his mind not to take his eyes off her during the whole day. He watched her closely and saw that when the flock passed the corner of an old broken-down wall at the foot of a hill, she quietly dropped behind and was out of sight in a moment. Peter examined the wall. He had seen it many a time before. People said that it was part of the ruins of an old castle. As he looked closely, he saw that just behind a hawthorn bush there was a hole large enough for a goat, or even a man on all fours, to pass through. This, then, was the place where Nanny disappeared so strangely. Indeed, she had worn quite a path beneath the hawthorn, and the only wonder was that her master had not discovered it before. The next day Peter watched her as before and when she ran slyly through the wall he followed her. After creeping on his hands and knees for some distance he found himself in a long and lofty cavern. The sunlight streamed through some crevices in the rocks and made the place look quite light and cheerful. At the farther end he saw Nanny busily picking up some oats that were scattered on the floor. How did the oats come there? The plump grains were constantly trickling down from above, and the goat had nothing to do but stand and eat. Peter could not understand it, but as he came near her he heard the stamping of heavy feet overhead and the whinnying of horses. "'Oh, somebody has a stable up there,' he said to himself. "'But how can that be? I have been all over these hills, and have never seen even the sign of a house.' As he was looking about him, a door in the side of the cavern suddenly opened, and a queer little fellow with a big head and saucer eyes came in. "'Good morning to you, sir,' said Peter thinking it was the stableman. I beg you will pardon me for coming in without any invitation. Is there anything I can do to serve you? The little man made no answer, but looked at Peter funnily with those great eyes and beckoned him to follow. Peter was too good-natured to refuse, and besides this he was curious to learn all about the strange place. So he followed his queer guide through the door and up a long flight of stairs, until he again felt the warm sun on his cheeks and saw the green grass beneath his feet. He saw that he was now in a square courtyard surrounded by stone walls and shaded by tall trees. His guide led him through another broad cavern and then out upon a green lawn that was fenced in on every side by tall cliffs and rocky heights. Near one end of the lawn were twelve old-fashioned knights playing at ninepins. The knights were dressed in a very queer way. They wore long hose and silver-buckled shoes. Their snow-white hair and beards reached almost to their knees. They scarcely noticed Peter, so busy were they at their game, and not one of them spoke a word. The guide motioned to Peter to pick up the nine pins and return the bowls to the bowlers. Peter was so badly frightened by the strangeness of everything that he dared not disobey. Trembling in every limb, he hastened to serve the knights as he was bidden. He noticed as the bowls were rolled over the lawn that they made a noise like thunder rumbling among the hills, and this frightened him still more. By and by, however, he began to gain courage. As the players were never in a hurry, he learned to humor himself and to do his work as slowly as he pleased. Looking around him, he saw a pitcher of wine and twelve golden goblets on a table at the end of the lawn. He did not stop to think that the goblets were for the knights, and that there was none for him. He was very thirsty, and he drank right out of the pitcher. The wine made him very brave. He felt that he would rather pick up nine pins than mind his neighbor's goats, and every time one of the bowls rolled toward the table, he would run and take another sip from the pitcher. 
At last, however, his head began to feel heavy, and while he was in the act of picking up the nine pins, he fell gently over upon the grass and went to sleep. When Peter Klaus awoke, he found himself lying on the grass where he had been in the habit of feeding his goats. He sat up and looked around. There were the same rocks upon which he had sat a hundred times, there were the same hills among which he had so often wandered, and there was the same noisy brook along which he had walked a thousand times with so much delight. But the trees and shrubs seemed strange to him. They were much larger than when he had seen them before, and there were many new ones that he did not remember. He looked for his goats, but they were nowhere in sight. He called, but not one of them came to him. He started out to seek them, but was surprised to see that all the well-known paths among the hills were overgrown with tall grass. He rubbed his eyes to make sure that he was awake. "'Strange, strange!' he muttered. "'I will go back to the village and see if the beasts are there.' His legs were so stiff that walking was a hard task. He stumbled along slowly, wondering why the rheumatism should trouble him so much. After a while he came to a spot from which he could see the village spread out before him at the bottom of the valley. It was the same pretty village of Zittendorf. He could not see that it had changed. He hurried along to the main road, hoping to find his flock there, but not a goat could he see. Before reaching the village he met a number of people but they were all strangers to him, and they looked at him so queerly that he did not dare to ask any questions. In the village the women and children stood in their doorways and stared at him as he passed. All were strangers to him. He noticed that some of them stroked their chins and laughed, and without thinking much about it, he put his hand to his own chin. What was his surprise to find that he had a beard more than a foot long? "'Ah, me!' thought he. "'Am I mad?' "'And has all the world gone mad, too? Where am I?' "'But he knew that the village was Zittendorf, "'for there were the church and the long street which he knew so well, "'and towering above them was the great Kufhäuser mountain, "'looking just as it did when he was a child. "'He went on until he came to his own house. "'It was greatly altered. "'The roof was beginning to fall in, the door was off its hinges, "'the rooms were empty and bare.' He called his wife and children by their names, but no one answered him. A strange dog came around the corner and snarled at him. A strange man in the next dooryard looked over the fence and told him to go away. Soon a crowd of idlers and women and children gathered around him. They were laughing at his long beard and his tattered clothes. A woman, who seemed more thoughtful than the rest, asked him what he wanted. "'I don't know what I want,' he answered. "'I came here to find my goats.' and I find everything and everybody lost. Does anybody know? He was about to inquire for his wife and children, but he thought how odd that would seem, and stopped short. He was silent for a moment. Then he looked around at the circle of strange faces and asked, Where is Kurt Steffen, the blacksmith? The crowd stared at him, but no one spoke. Then an old woman who had hobbled across the street to look at him answered, Kurt Steffen? Why, Kurt Steffen went to the wars years and years ago. Nobody has heard from him since. Poor Peter Klaus looked around him, more dazed than ever. His lips quivered pitifully as he asked, Then where is Valentina Meyer, the shoemaker? Ah, me, answered another old woman. Valentina has been lying for nearly twenty years in a house that he will never leave. Peter thought that he had seen both of the old women before but as he remembered them, they were young and handsome, and of about his own age. He was about to ask another question, when he saw a sprightly young mother, who looked very much like his wife, coming down the street. She was leading a little girl about four years of age, and on her arm was a year-old baby. He staggered and rubbed his eyes, and leaned against the wall for support. "'Does, does anybody know Peter Klaus the goatherd?' he stammered. "'Peter Klaus!' cried the young mother. Why, that was my father's name. It is now twenty years since he was lost. His flock came home without him one evening, and all the village searched night and day among the hills and on the mountain, but could not find him. I was then only four years old. And are you little Maria? asked Peter, trembling harder than ever. My name is Maria, was the answer, but I am no longer little Maria. And I am your father, cried Peter. I am Peter Klaus, who was lost. Don't any of you know Peter Klaus? All who heard him were filled with astonishment, 
and Maria with her two children rushed into his arms, crying, "'Welcome, father, welcome home again. I felt sure it was you as soon as I saw you.' And soon all the old people in the village came to greet him. "'Peter Klaus, yes, yes, it seems only yesterday that you drove our goats to the pasture. How time does fly. Welcome, old neighbor. Welcome home after being away twenty years.' Such is the old, old story of Peter Klaus. Hundreds of years ago the people of Germany talked about it and laughed over it. It is perhaps even older than the second part of the legend of Frederick Barbarossa, which, as you will remember, has some resemblance to it, and also relates to a mysterious cavern in the Kufhäuser mountain. End of Peter Klaus the Goatherd Recording by Kalinda in Lüneburg, Germany on February 15th, 2009. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Pigs is Pigs by Ellis Parker Butler Mike Flannery the Westcote agent of the Interurban Express Company, leaned over the counter of the express office and shook his fist. Mr. Morehouse, angry and red, stood on the other side of the counter, trembling with rage. The argument had been long and heated, and at last Mr. Morehouse had talked himself speechless. The cause of the trouble stood on the counter between the two men. It was a soap-box, across the top of which were nailed a number of strips, forming a rough but serviceable cage. In it two spotted guinea-pigs were greedily eating lettuce-leaves. "'Do as you like, then,' shouted Flannery. "'Pay for them and take them. Or don't pay for them and leave them be. Rules is rules, Mr. Morehouse.' and Mike Flannery's not going to be called down for breaking of them. "'But you everlastingly stupid idiot!' shouted Mr. Morehouse, madly shaking a flimsy printed book beneath the agent's nose. "'Can't you read it here, in your own plain printed rates? Pets, domestic, Franklin to Westcott, if properly boxed, twenty-five cents each!' He threw the book on the counter in disgust. "'What more do you want? Aren't they pets? Aren't they domestic? Aren't they properly boxed? What?' He turned and walked back and forth rapidly, frowning ferociously. Suddenly he turned to Flannery, and, forcing his voice to an artificial calmness, spoke slowly but with intense sarcasm. "'Pets,' he said, "'P-E-T-S.' Twenty-five cents each. There are two of them. One, two. Two times twenty-five are fifty. Can you understand that? I offer you fifty cents. Flannery reached for the book. He ran his hands through the pages and stopped at page sixty-four. And I don't take fifty cents, he whispered in mockery. Here's the rule for it. When the agent be in any doubt regarding which of two rates applies to a shipment, he shall charge the larger. The consignee may file a claim for the overcharge. In this case, Mr. Morehouse, I be in doubt. Pets them animals may be, and domestic they may be, but pigs I'm blame sure they do be. And me rule says plain as the nose on your face, pigs, Franklin to Westcott, thirty cents each. And Mr. Morehouse, by me arithmetical knowledge, two times thirty comes to sixty cents. Mr. Morehouse shook his head savagely. Nonsense, he shouted. Confounded nonsense, I tell you. Why, you poor ignorant foreigner, that rule means common pigs, domestic pigs, not guinea pigs. Flannery was stubborn. Pigs is pigs he declared firmly. Guinea pigs, or dago pigs, or Irish pigs is all the same to the Interurban Express Company and to Mike Flannery. 
The nationality of the pig creates no differentiality in the right, Mr. Morehouse. "'Twould be the same was they Dutch pigs or Russian pigs. "'My flannery,' he added, "'is here to tend to the express business, "'and not to hold conversation with dago pigs in seventeen languages "'for to discover be they Chinese or temporary by birth and nativity.' "'Mr. Morehouse hesitated. "'He bit his lip and then flung out his arms wildly. "'Very well,' he shouted. "'You shall hear of this.' your president shall hear of this it is an outrage i have offered you fifty cents you refuse it keep the pigs until you are ready to take the fifty cents but by george sir if one hair of those pigs heads is harmed i will have the law on you he turned and stalked out slamming the door flannery carefully lifted the soap-box from the counter and placed it in a corner he was not worried he felt the peace that comes to a faithful servant who has done his duty and done it well. Mr. Morehouse went home raging. His boy, who had been awaiting the guinea pigs, knew better than to ask for them. He was a normal boy, and therefore always had a guilty conscience when his father was angry. So the boy slipped quietly around the house. There is nothing so soothing to a guilty conscience as to be out of the path of the avenger. Mr. Morehouse stormed into the house. "'Where's the ink?' he shouted at his wife, as soon as his foot was across the door-sill. Mrs. Morehouse jumped, guiltily. She never used ink. She had not seen the ink, nor moved the ink, nor thought of the ink. But her husband's tone convicted her of the guilt of having born and reared a boy and she knew that, whenever her husband wanted anything in a loud voice, the boy had been at it. "'I'll find Sammy,' she said meekly. When the ink was found, Mr. Morehouse wrote rapidly, and he read the completed letter and smiled a triumphant smile. Huh, "'That'll settle that crazy Irishman,' he exclaimed. "'When they get that letter, he'll hunt another job, all right.' A week later, Mr. Morehouse received a long official envelope with the card of the Interurban Express Company in the upper left-hand corner. He tore it open eagerly and drew out a sheet of paper. At the top it bore the number A6754. The letter was short. Subject, rate, on guinea pigs, it said. Dear Sir, we are in receipt of your letter regarding rate on guinea pigs between Franklin and Westcott addressed to the president of this company. All claims for overcharge should be addressed to the claims department. Mr. Morehouse wrote to the claims department. He wrote six pages of choice sarcasm, vituperation, and argument, and sent them to the claims department. A few weeks later he received a reply from the claims department. Attached to it was his last letter. Dear sir, said the reply, your letter of the 16th addressed to this department, subject rate on guinea pigs from Franklin to Westcott, received. We have taken up the matter with our agent at Westcott, and his reply is attached herewith. He informs us that you refused to receive the consignment, or to pay the charges. You have therefore no claim against this company and your letter regarding the proper rate on the consignment should be addressed to our tariff department. Mr. Morehouse wrote to the tariff department. He stated his case clearly, and gave his arguments in full, quoting a page or two from the encyclopedia to prove that guinea pigs were not common pigs. With the care that characterizes corporations when they are systematically conducted, Mr. Morehouse's letter was numbered, okayed, and started through the regular channels. Duplicate copies of the bill of lading, manifest, Flannery's receipt for the package, and several other pertinent papers were pinned to the letter, and they were passed to the head of the tariff department. The head of the tariff department put his feet on his desk and yawned. He looked through the papers carelessly. "'Miss Kane,' he said to his stenographer, "'take this letter. Agent, Westcott, 
New Jersey. Please advise why consignment referred to in attached papers was refused domestic pet rates. Miss Kane made a series of curves and angles on her notebook and waited with the pencil poised. The head of the department looked at the papers again. Ha, huh, guinea pigs, he said. Probably starved to death by this time. Add this to that letter. Give condition of consignment at present. He tossed the papers onto the stenographer's desk, took his feet from his own desk, and went out to lunch. When Mike Flannery received the letter, he scratched his head. Give present condition? He repeated thoughtfully. Now what do them clocks be wantin' to know, I wonder? Present condition, is it? Them pigs pray St. Patrick. Do be in good health, so far as I know. But I never was no veterinary surgeon to Digo pigs. Maybe them clerks wants me to call in the pig doctor and have their pulses took. One thing I do know, however, which is they've glorious appetites for pigs of their size. Eight? They'd ate the brass padlocks off a barn door if I, the paddy pig, by the same token, ate as hearty as these Digo pigs do. <laughs> There'd be a famine in Ireland. To assure himself that his report would be up to date, Flannery went to the rear of the office and looked into the cage. The pigs had been transferred to a larger box, a dry goods box. One, two, three, four, five six seven eight he counted seven spotted and one all black all well and arty and all eaten like ragin hippopotamuses he went back to his desk and wrote mr morgan head of tariff department he wrote why do i say dago pigs is pigs because they is pigs and will be till you say they ain't which is what the rule book says Stop your jollying me, you know it as well as I do. As do elf, they are all well, and open you are the same. P.S. There are eight now, the family increased, all good eaters. P.S. I paid out so far two dollars for cabbage, which they like. Shall I put in bill for same what? Morgan, head of the tariff department, when he received this letter, laughed. He read it again and became serious. "'By George,' he said, "'Flannery is right. Pigs is pigs. I'll have to get authority on this thing. Meanwhile, Miss Kane, take this letter. Agent, Westcott, New Jersey. Regarding the shipment, guinea pigs. File number A6754. Rule 83. General instruction to agents.' clearly states that agents shall collect from consignee all costs of provender, etc., etc., required for livestock while in transit or storage. You will proceed to collect same from consignee. Flannery received this letter next morning, and when he read it, he grinned. Proceed to collect, he said softly. <laughs> How them clocks do like to be talking! Me proceed to collect two dollars and twenty-five cents off Mr. Morehouse. I wonder do them clerks know Mr. Morehouse? I'll get it. Oh, yes. <laughs> Mr. Morehouse, two and a quarter, please. Certainly, me dear friend Flannery. Delighted. Ha, huh, not. Flannery drove the express wagon to Mr. Morehouse's door. Mr. Morehouse answered the bell. Aha! Uh -huh. He cried as soon as he saw it was flattery. So you've come to your senses at last, have you? I thought you would. Bring the box in. I have no box, said Flannery coldly. I have a bill against Mr. John C. Morehouse for two dollars and twenty-five cents for cabbages eaten by his dago pigs. Would you wish to pay it? Pay? Cabbages? Do you mean to say that two little guinea pigs? Eight. Papa and Mama and the six children. Eight. For answer, Mr. Morehouse slammed the door in Flannery's face. Flannery looked at the door reproachfully. I take it the consignee don't want to pay for them cabbages, he said. 
If I know signs of refusal, the consignee refuses to pay for one dang cabbage leaf and be hanged to me. Mr. Morgan, head of the tariff department, consulted the president of the Interurban Express Company regarding guinea pigs as to whether they were pigs or not pigs. The president was inclined to treat the matter lightly. What is the rate on pigs and pets? he asked. Pigs, thirty cents, pets, twenty-five, said Morgan. Then, of course, guinea pigs are pigs, said the president. Yes, agreed, Morgan. I look at it that way, too. A thing that can come under two rates is naturally due to be classed as the higher. But are guinea pigs pigs? Aren't they rabbits? Come to think of it, said the president. I believe they are more like rabbits. Sort of halfway station between pig and rabbit. I think the question is this. Are guinea pigs of the domestic pig family? I'll ask Professor Gordon. He is authority on such things. Leave the papers with me. The president put the papers on his desk and wrote a letter to Professor Gordon. Unfortunately, the professor was in South America collecting zoological specimens, and the letter was forwarded to him by his wife. As the professor was in the highest Andes, where no white man had ever penetrated, the letter was many months in reaching him. The president forgot the guinea pigs. Morgan forgot them. Mr. Morehouse forgot them. But Flannery did not. One half of his time he gave to the duties of his agency. The other half was devoted to the guinea pigs. Long before Professor Gordon received the president's letter, Morgan received one from Flannery. About them dago pigs, it said. What shall I do? They are great in family life. No race suicide for them. There are thirty-two now. Shall I sell them? Do you take this express office for a menagerie? Answer quick. Morgan reached for a telegraph blank and wrote, Agent, Westcott, don't sell pigs. He then wrote Flannery a letter, calling his attention to the fact that the pigs were not the property of the company, but were merely being held during a settlement of a dispute regarding rates. He advised Flannery to take the best possible care of them. Flannery, letter in hand, looked at the pigs and sighed. The dry goods box cage had become too small. He boarded up twenty feet of the rear of the express office, to make a large and airy home for them, and went about his business. He worked with feverish intensity when out of his rounds, for the pigs required attention, and took most of his time. Some months later, in desperation, he seized a sheet of paper and wrote one hundred and sixty across it, and mailed it to Morgan. Morgan returned it, asking for explanation. Flannery replied, there be now one hundred and sixty of them dago pigs. For heaven's sake, let me sell some off. Do you want me to go crazy, what? Sell no pigs, Morgan wired. Not long after this, the president of the express company received a letter from Professor Gordon. It was a long and scholarly letter, but the point was that the guinea pig was the cava aparoea, while the common pig was the genus Sus of the family Suidae. He remarked that they were prolific and multiplied rapidly. They are not pigs, said the president, decidedly to Morgan. The twenty-five cent rate applies. Morgan made the proper notation on the papers that had accumulated in file A6754, and turned them over to the audit department. The audit department took some time to look the matter up, and, after the usual delay, wrote Flannery that, as he had on hand one hundred and sixty guinea pigs, the property of consignee, he should deliver them and collect charges at the rate of twenty-five cents each. Flannery spent a day herding his charges through a narrow opening in their cage, so that he might count them. Audit Department he wrote, when he had finished the count. 
you are way off there maybe was one hundred and sixty digo pigs once but wake up don't be a back number i've got even eight hundred now shall i collect for eight hundred or what how about sixty four dollars i paid out for cabbages it required a great many letters back and forth before the audit department was able to understand why the error had been made of billing one hundred and sixty instead of eight hundred and still more time for it to get the meaning of the cabbages flannery was crowded into a few feet at the extreme front of the office the pigs had all the rest of the room and two boys were employed constantly attending to them the day after flannery had counted the guinea pigs there were eight more added to his drove and by the time the audit department gave him authority to collect for eight hundred flannery had given up all attempts to attend to the receipt or the delivery of goods he was hastily building galleries around the express office tier above tier he had four thousand and sixty-four guinea pigs to care for more were arriving daily immediately following its authorization the audit department sent another letter but flannery was too busy to open it they wrote another and then they telegraphed error in guinea pig bill collect for two guinea pigs fifty cents deliver all to consignee flannery read the telegram and cheered up he wrote out a bill as rapidly as his pencil could travel over paper and ran all the way over to the morehouse home at the gate he stopped suddenly the house stared at him with vacant eyes the windows were bare of curtains and he could see into the empty rooms a sign on the porch said to let mr morehouse had moved flannery ran all the way back to the express office sixty-nine guinea pigs had been born during his absence he ran out again and made feverish inquiries in the village. Mr. Morehouse had not only moved, but he had left Westcote. Flannery returned to the express office and found that two hundred and six guinea pigs had entered the world since he left it. He wrote a telegram to the audit department. Can't collect fifty cents for two dago pigs consignee has left town address unknown what shall i do flannery the telegram was handed to one of the clerks in the audit department and as he read it he laughed <laughs> flannery must be crazy he ought to know that the thing to do is return the consignment here said the clerk he telegraphed flannery to send the pigs to the main office of the company at franklin when Flannery received the telegram, he set to work. The six boys he had engaged to help him also set to work. They worked with the haste of desperate men, making cages out of soap boxes, cracker boxes, all kinds of boxes, and as fast as the cages were completed, they filled them with guinea pigs and expressed them to Franklin. Day after day, the cages of guinea pigs flowed in a steady stream from Westcote to Franklin, and still Flannery and his six helpers ripped and nailed and packed, relentlessly and feverishly. At the end of the week they had shipped two hundred and eighty cases of guinea pigs, and there were, in the express office, seven hundred and four more pigs than when they began packing them. Stop sending pigs! Warehouse full! came a telegram to Flannery. He stopped packing only long enough to wire back, Can't stop! and kept on sending them. On the next train up from Franklin came one of the company's inspectors. He had instructions to stop the stream of guinea pigs at all hazards. As his train drew up at Westcote Station, he saw a cattle car standing on the express company's siding. When he reached the express office, he saw the express wagon backed up to the door. Six boys were carrying bushel baskets full of guinea pigs from the office and dumping them into the wagon. Inside the room, Flannery, 
with his coat and vest off, was shoveling guinea pigs into bushel baskets with a coal scoop. He was winding up the guinea pig episode. He looked up at the inspector with a snort of anger. Humph! One wagon load more, and I'll be quit of them. And never will ye catch Flannery with no more foreign pigs on his hands. No, sir, they near was the death of me. Next time I'll know that pigs of whatever nationality is domestic pigs, and go at the lowest rate. He began shoveling again rapidly, speaking quickly between breaths. Rules may be rules, but you can't fool Mike Flannery twice with the same trick. When it comes to livestock, dang the rules. So long as Flannery runs this express office, pigs is pets, and cows is pets, and horses is pets, and lions and tigers and Rocky Mountain goats is pets, and the rate on them is twenty-five cents. He paused long enough to tell one of the boys to put an empty basket in the place of the one he had just filled. There were only a few guinea pigs left. As he noted their limited number, his natural habit of looking on the bright side returned. Well, anyhow, he said cheerfully, tis not so bad as it might be. What if them dago pigs had been elephants? End of Pigs is Pigs by Ellis Parker Butler Narrated by Dennis Sayers in Modesto, California, and characterized by Sandra Kincaid in Wales, United Kingdom, September 2006. Robinson Crusoe This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Robinson Crusoe by an anonymous author abridged for young readers for the McLaughlin Brothers Aunt Kate series 1880 I was born at York in the year 1632 of a good family my father's name was Kurtznayer a native of Bremen who by trading at Hull gained a very plentiful fortune he married my mother at York, and as her maiden name was Robinson, I was called Robinson Kritznair, which not being easily pronounced in the English tongue, we are now called, and indeed call ourselves, and write our name Crusoe. No pains or charge was spared in my education, my father designing me for the law, Yet nothing would serve me, but I must go to sea, both against the will of my father, the tears of my mother, and the entreaties of friends. I was then, I think, nineteen years old, when, one time, being at Hull, I met a schoolfellow, going with his father, who was master of a ship to London, and telling him of my roving desires, he assured me of a free passage, without imploring a blessing, or taking farewell of my parents. I took shipping on the 1st of September, 1651, for London. After making several voyages from thence to the coast of Guinea, I finally sailed for the Brazils. Then, northward upon the coast, till our ship made Cape Augustine, in order to gain Africa, from whence, going further into the ocean, we met with a terrible tempest. When the weather cleared up a little, we found ourselves upon the coast of Guinea. We then laid our course for the Leeward Islands, but a second storm succeeding drove us to the westward, so we were afraid of falling into the hands of cruel savages, or the paws of beasts of prey. In this distress, one of our men cried out, Land! Land! Which he had no sooner said than our ship struck upon a sandbank, and the sea breaking over her, we expected all to have perished immediately. While we stood looking at one another, 
expecting death every moment, the mate laid hold of the boat, and with the help of the rest flung it over the ship's side, and all getting in, we committed ourselves to God's mercy. When we had been driven about a league and a half, a large wave came rolling astern of us, and overset the boat. I was overwhelmed with water, going I know not whither, but, as I thought, into a dismal gulf unknown, while all my companions were overpowered and entombed in the deep, I was at length dashed against a piece of rock in such a manner as left me senseless, but recovering a little, before the return of the wave, I pushed forward and reached the mainland. Tired and almost spent, I sank down on the grass by the cliffs of the shore, free from the dangers of the foaming ocean. I cast my eyes around to behold what place I was in. I could see no house nor people. I was wet, yet had no clothes, hungry and thirsty, yet had nothing to eat or drink. The darksome night coming upon me, I got up into a thick, bushy tree, and seating myself so that I could not fall, a deep sleep overtook me. It was broad day the next morning before I awoke, and came down from the tree. The tempest had ceased, and the ship lay about a mile from the place where I was. I resolved to swim to the ship, and leaped into the water. After I reached it, I found great difficulty in getting on board. Finding the provisions in good order, I crammed my pockets, and losing no time, ate while I was doing other things. I fell to work, and flung overboard several spare yards, a spare topmast or two, and two or three large spars of wood, tying every one of them with a rope, that they might not drift away. Then I went down to the ship's side, and tied the spars fast together in the form of a raft, and crossed them with the plank, until I found it would carry a considerable burden. I then considered what I should load it with. I first lowered down all the plank and boards I could get, then three seamen's chests, which I filled with bread, rice, Dutch cheese, dried goat's flesh, and corn, some clothes, and some bottles of wine. Next the carpenter's chest, some fowling pieces, powder and shot, besides several other weapons. I then put to sea, and after many trials, landed in a cave on the bank of a little river. Not far off I espied a hill of great height, and there I resolved to go and view the country, that I might see what part of it was best to fix my abode in. I found I was on an island, a place inhabited, probably, only by wild beasts. When I went back to the raft, I brought my effects on shore, and made a kind of hut with my chests and boards, piling the empty chests and casts in a circle to fortify it against any sudden attack. I had been twelve times on board the ship, bringing away all that was possible, including ship stores, carpenters' tools, ammunition, weapons, etc., a compass and spy-glass, a large amount of gold and silver, and when I looked out the next morning, the ship was no more to be seen. I now began to think how I should secure myself from savages and wild beasts. At one time I thought of digging a cave, and at another I thought of erecting a tent, and finally I resolved to do both. I found a steep rock by the side of a hill, and there I resolved my tent should stand. I drove in two rows of stakes, enclosing a space of some ten yards, in a half circle. Then with my boards and plank I built me a little castle. I had no door, 
but went in and out by a ladder which I made. Here was my fortress, into which I carried all my riches, ammunition, and stores. After this I added a cellar, thatched the roof, and made many other improvements, which cost me many a day's labor and pains. During all this time I yearned for some companion to whom I could talk. I had taken from the ship two cats and a dog, and these often accompanied me in my rambles. On one of these, coming upon some parrots, I knocked one down, and took it home with me. After a while I taught it to talk, and it did much to relieve the dullness of my home. At another time I carried home a kid that my dog would have killed had I not stopped him. I had been often thinking of getting a kid or two, and so raising a breed of tame goats, and I thought this a good time to make a beginning. One day I found some barley and rice springing up near my castle. I had emptied an old sack at this place, little thinking that the thoughtless act would point out to me a way of getting an ample supply of food. But so it happened, for it taught me to raise crops. But it was a long time before I learned to grind or sift my grain, and to make it into bread. During all my stay on the island, I had kept a record of time, by cutting a notch each day upon a square post, making the notches longer for Sundays than for other days, and longer for the first day of each month than for Sundays. And as each Sunday came round, I made it a day of rest, reading my Bible, and giving thanks to God that he had been so merciful to me, and made my solitary life so comfortable. A year had now passed, and every day I watched and prayed for some means of deliverance from this place, and then I began to think if it was not possible to make a canoe, such as Indians make out of the trunk of a tree. At last I selected a tree. Twenty days was I hacking and hewing this tree, fourteen in cutting off the limbs, and a month in shaping it like the bottom of a boat. When it was completed, I found it was so large that I was unable to get it to the water, and sadly gave up my undertaking. In the height of this work I found I had lived four years upon the island. The next year passed very quietly, and although I was disappointed in my first canoe, I made a second one of much smaller size, but it was two years before I had finished it and got it to the water. I now resolved to make a tour of the island. I set out on the 6th of November, in the seventh year of my captivity. After a while I brought my boat safe to a little cove, and laid down to take a welcome repose. When I awoke I left the boat, and made a trip into the island. I found plenty of delicious fruits and brought many back with me. I saw many goats with their kids, and I conceived the idea of capturing them by making pitfalls and traps, baited with barley and rice. I knew that if I wanted to furnish myself with goat's flesh, the breeding them up, like a flock of sheep, about my hut was the only method I could take. On my return from my tour, I set some traps, and one morning I found in one of them an old he-goat, and in the other one male and two female kids. It was some time before they would feed, but after throwing them some sweet corn they began to be tamer. I enclosed a piece of ground to keep them in, and in about a year and a half's time I had a flock of twelve goats. I often gave them ears of barley, or a handful of rice, 
by which means they grew very tame. In two years more I had forty-three, beside what I had killed for my living. One day it happened that going to my boat I saw the print of a man's naked foot on the shore. Had I seen a demon of the most frightful shape, I could not have been more confounded. I listened and cast my eyes around, but could hear nor see anything. I returned to my castle, frightened at every bush and tree, taking everything for men, and my mind filled with the wildest ideas. That night my eyes never closed. In the morning I ventured out of my hut and milked my goats, but I was constantly thinking of means to provide me with greater security. I even thought of pulling down my enclosures, turning my cattle wild into the woods, and digging up my cornfields that the enemy might not find them, and learn that I lived upon the island. Some fifteen months afterward, in the morning, before it was light, there appeared from the seashore a flaming light about two miles from me, but upon my side of the island. I was struck with a terrible surprise, and went at once to my castle, and pulled the ladder after me. I loaded my muskets and pistols, and resolved to defend myself until my last breath. Anxious to see what was going on, I went to the top of a hill, and there saw nine naked savages eating, as I supposed, human flesh, with two canoes hauled up, waiting for the tide to carry them off again. After they had gone, I went to the spot, and saw the blood, bones, and parts of the flesh of the human bodies whom they had eaten. I was so fired with anger that I resolved to be revenged on the next who came there. The chance came about a year later, but instead of two, there were five canoe loads, containing over thirty of the savages. Seeing so great a number, my heart sunk within me. I saw their horrible orgies, and I saw them drag two poor creatures from the boats. Soon one of them fell upon the ground, knocked down, as I supposed, with a club or wooden sword. The other poor creature looked around him with a wistful eye, but seeing himself a little at liberty, nature, as it were, inspired him with the hopes of life. He started from them, and ran swiftly along the sands toward my castle. Two of the savages pursued him, but he ran so nimbly that he gained on them every moment. As he drew near my castle, I seized my guns, and taking a short cut down the hill, threw myself between the fugitive and his pursuers, hallowing loudly and beckoning them to turn back at the same time advancing on the two who followed him, and rushing on the foremost, I knocked him down with the stock of my gun. I was loath to fire, lest the rest should hear. The other savage, seeing his fellow fall, took his bow from his back, and was fixing his arrow to shoot me, when I was forced to fire, and kill him. After I had killed the two savages, the one pursued was induced to come to me, but he did so with fear and trembling, and kneeled down and kissed the ground, and, placing my foot upon his head, gave me to understand that he was my slave. I took him up, and made much of him in the best way I could. He was a handsome fellow, well made with straight, long limbs, and seemed about twenty-six years of age. This happened on Friday, and I gave him to understand that Friday would be his name,
because it was upon that day I saved his life. Then I taught him to say, Master, which I made him sensible, was to be my name. I took him home with me, and fed him. I also gave him a suit of clothes, such as I had made for myself from the skins of goats and other animals, and, after a while, I taught him to do all the kind of work that I had heretofore had to perform, not forgetting to instruct him in the Bible, and to cease all work on the Sabbath day. Friday proved himself a very sincere, loving, and faithful servant, and in a short time could understand nearly all that I said to him, and I began to love him, and spared no pains to instruct him. I, too, learned many things from him, not the least of which was boat-building, for by his aid and judgment I was enabled to build and launch a large boat, which I styled my man-of-war, and which I designed to take me to land where Friday said there were white men living. One morning, while getting ready for this expedition, Friday came running into me, as though pursued for life, crying, Oh, dear master, oh, sorrow, oh, sorrow, bad, oh, bad. Why, what's the matter, Friday? said I. Oh, yonder, yonder, said he, be one, two, three canoes, one, two, three. Surely, thought I, there must be six, by my man's way of reckoning, but on stricter inquiry I found there were but three. Well, Friday, said I, don't be terrified. I warrant we will not only defend ourselves, but kill most of these savages. But though I comforted him in the best way I could, the poor creature trembled so I scarce knew what to do with him. Oh, master, said he, they come. Look, Friday, cut pieces, Friday, cut me up. Why, Friday, said I, they will eat me up as well as you, and my danger is as great as yours. But since it is so, we must resolve to fight for our lives. What say you? Can you fight, Friday? Yes, he said faintly. Me shoot, me kill what I can. That's no matter, said I again. Our guns will terrify those we do not kill. I am very willing to stand by you to the last drop of my blood. Now, tell me if you will do the like by me, and obey my orders. Friday answered, Oh, master, me lose life for you, me die when you bid die. We loaded two fowling pieces, four muskets, and two pistols, and divided them betwixt us, hung my sword to my side, and gave Friday a hatchet, a fine weapon for defense. And then, under this heavy load of armor, which was increased by our extra powder and shot, we marched in single file to a thick wood that stood between them and us. We found them all about their fires, eating the flesh of one of their prisoners, and that another lay bound upon the sand. I ascended a tree, and saw by my glass that a white man lay upon the beach, with his hands and feet tied with things like rushes. Turning to Friday, I said, Now, Friday, mind what I say. Fail in nothing, but do exactly as you see me do. Are you ready? said I. Yes, master, said he. Then fire at them, said I, and the same moment I fired also. We fired two or three rounds, and then rushed upon them. The savages were thrown into confusion, and so bewildered they knew not what to do. Cutting loose the white man, who proved to be a Spaniard, 
I gave him a sword and pistol, and he soon cut two of the savages to pieces. Before our work of slaughter was done, we had killed all but four of the savages, and these had fled to one of the canoes. I jumped into one of the canoes, and bid Friday follow me. But here I found another creature, bound hand and foot, with very little life left in him. I bid Friday speak to him, and tell him he was safe, and give him a dram from my flask. As soon as Friday heard him speak, he went into transports. He kissed, embraced, and hugged him, cried, laughed, danced, sung, and wrung his hands, like one distracted, and it was a great while before I could make him speak. But, at last, he told me, he was his father. We rubbed the limbs of the two men whom we had saved, and took them to our castle, where we gave them plenty to eat and drink. A few days afterward, in talking with the Spaniard, I learned that he had been shipwrecked with sixteen of his fellow countrymen, and that they were then dragging a pitiful existence on the mainland. If I should invite them here, said I, would they make me a prisoner, or would they obey me and work with me in my little kingdom? They are honest and true men, he replied, and would scorn to act so basely to their deliverer. And then he said that, if I pleased, he and the old savage would go over and talk with them about it, and bring me an answer that they should all swear fidelity to me, and he would do the same, and stand to me with the last drop of his blood. So finally I sent them over to the mainland, with full power to carry out this agreement. Scarce a fortnight had passed when, impatient for their return, I laid down to sleep one morning, but was awakened by Friday, who called, Master! Master, they are come! I jumped from my bed, and, seizing my glass, looked toward the sea. About half a league off, I saw a boat. Climbing the mountain at the back of my castle, I plainly saw, in the distance, an English ship. As the boat drew near the shore, I perceived that three within it were prisoners, and I was concerned to know what was the object of their visit to the island. I was glad when I saw they were set at liberty, while the rascally seamen, leaving three in the boat, scattered about as though they wished to see the place. The three poor distressed creatures, too anxious to get any response, were seated under the shade of a great tree. I approached them and asked, what are you, gentlemen? They all started up. Don't be afraid, said I. Perhaps you have a friend, nearer than you expect. He must be from heaven, said one of them gravely, for we are past the help of man. Tell me your condition, I replied. Perhaps I can save you. The story, said he, is too long, but, sir, I was master of that ship, my men mutinied, and, as a favor, they have put these two men, one my mate, the other a passenger, with me, on shore, without murdering us. I then made conditions that they should obey me while on the island, and if I recovered their ship, they should afford Friday and myself a free passage to England to which they gave a cheerful assent. Then I gave each a gun, with powder and ball sufficient, and, as the mutineers returned, they fired upon them, and killed one of the captain's chief enemies, and wounded the other, who called loudly for help. Sirrah, said the captain, going up to him, "'Tis too late to call for assistance,' You should rather cry to God to pardon your villainy 
and so he knocked him down with the stock of his gun. Three others were wounded also, and cried out for pardon. The captain granted this, if they would swear to be true to him in recovering the ship, which they solemnly promised to do. The other three were easily made prisoners. So far all worked very well, but still there were twenty-six hands on board the ship, and they were signalizing for their comrades to return. We made a small hole in the boat in which they had come on shore. This obliged them to send another boat, with ten armed men. Among them were three lads who had been forced into the mutiny. Leaving three men to look after the boat, the other seven started in quest of their companions. One of our party led them a wild chase, constantly answering their calls, and in the meantime we surprised and captured the men in the boat. On the return of the other seven, we fired at them, killing the boatswain, and wounding two others, while the rest ran about, wringing their hands, but were glad enough to surrender, and submit to be bound. The captain then expostulated with them, saying the governor of the island was an Englishman, who might execute them here, but he thought they would all be sent to England. They begged piteously to be spared, and, after a while, the captain, in the governor's name, agreed to pardon them if they would aid him in getting back the ship, telling them they would be hanged in chains if they acted in bad faith. We set out for the ship in two parties, and completely surprised those on board. In the scuffle that ensued, the pirate chief was shot through the head, and a few others were injured. Nothing now remained but to dispose of the prisoners. Consulting with the captain, I dressed myself in one of his suits, and sending for them, told them I was going to leave the island with all my people, and promised that their lives should be spared if they would stay there. They agreed to stay. Then I told them my story, and giving them every information necessary for their subsistence, and bidding them farewell, went on board the ship. The next morning we weighed anchor, and Friday and I bade adieu to the island, and after an absence of twenty-eight years, two months, and nineteen days, landed in my own country, hoping to end my days in peace. End of Robinson Crusoe Read by Dennis Sayers in Modesto, California for LibriVox Summer 2008This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Today's reading by Tom Hackett, djhackett.newgrounds.com. Year of the Big Thaw by Marion Zimmer Bradley. You say that Matthew is your own son, Mr. Emmett? Yes, Reverend Down. And a better boy never stepped, if I do say it as shouldn't. I've trusted him to drive team for me since he was eleven, and you can't say more than that for a farm boy. Way back when he was a little shaver so high, when the war came on, he was bound and he was going to sail with this Admiral Farragut. You know, boys that age, <laughs> like runaway colts. I couldn't see no good in his being cabin boy on some tarnation navy ship, and I told him so. If he'd wanted to sail out on a whaling ship, I allow I'd have let him go. But Martha, that's the boy's ma, took on so that Matt stayed home. Yes, he's a good boy and a good son. 
We'll miss him a powerful lot if he gets this scholarship thing. But I allow it'll be good for the boy to get some learning besides what he gets in the school here. It's right kind of you, Reverend, to look over this application thing for me. Well, if he is your own son, Mr. Emmett, why did you write birthplace unknown on the line here? Reverend Doon, I'm glad you asked me that question. I've been turning it over in my mind, and I've just about come to the conclusion it wouldn't be no how fair to hold it back. I didn't lie when I said Matt was my son, because he's been a good son to me and Martha. But I'm not his pa, and Martha ain't his ma, so could be I stretched the truth just a mite. Reverend Doon, it's a tarnal funny yarn, but I'll walk into the meeting house and swear to it on a stack of bibles as thick as a cord of wood. You know I've been farming the old corning place these past seven years. It's good flat Connecticut bottom land, but it isn't like our land up in Hampshire where I was born and raised. My pa called it the Hampshire Grants. I know that was Kingsland when his pa came in there and started farming at the foot of Scuttock Mountain. That's engine for fires, folks say, because the engines used to build fires up there in the spring for some of their heathen doodads. Anyhow, up there in the mountains we see eternal power of queer things. You call to mind the year we had the big thaw, about twelve years before the war? You mind the blizzard that year? I heard tell it spread down most of York, and at Fort Orange, the place they call Albany now, the Hudson froze right over, so they say. But those York folks do a sight of exaggerating, I'm told. Anyhow, when the ice went out, there was an almighty good thaw all over. When the snow run off Scuttock Mountain, there was a good-sized hunk of farmland in our valley that went underwater. The creek of my farm flowed over the bank, and there was a foot of water in the cow shed. And down in the swimming hole in the back pasture wasn't nothing but a big gully, fifty foot and more across, rushing through the pasture, deep as a lake and brown as the old cow. You know fresh at floods? Full up with sticks and stones and old dead trees and some of his old shed floating down the middle. And I swear to goodness, Parson, that stream was running along so fast, I saw four-inch cobblestones floating and bumping along. I tied the cow and the calf and Kate. She was our white mare, you mind. She went lame last year, and I had to shoot her. But she was just a young mare, and as skittish as all get out. She was a good little mare. A anyhow, I tied the whole kitten caboodle of them in the woodshed up behind the house where they'd be dry, and I started to get the milk pail. Right then, I heard the gosh awfulest screech I ever heard in my life. Sounded like thunder and a freshet and a forest fire all at once. I dropped the milk pails. I heard Martha scream inside the house, and I run outside. Martha was already there in the yard, and she points up in the sky and yelled, Look up yonder! We stood looking up at the sky over Shattuck Mountain, where there was a great big shoot now. I don't know as I can call its name, but it was like a trail of fire in the sky. It was making the dangest racket you ever heard, Reverend. Looked kind of like one of them Fourth of July sky rockets, but it was big as a house. Martha was screaming, and she grabbed me and hollered, Hez, Hez, what in tongue it is it? And when Martha cusses like that, Reverend, she don't know what she's saying. She's so scared. I was plumb scared myself. I heard Liza, that's our young'un, Liza Grace, that got married to the tailor boy. I heard her crying on the stoop, and she came flying out with her penny all black and hollered to Martha that the pea soup was burning. Martha let out another screech and ran for the house. That's a woman for you. So I quietened Liza down some, and I went in and told Martha it weren't no more than one of them shooting stars, and I went and did the milking. But, you know, while we were sitting down to supper, there came the most awful grinding, screeching, pounding crash I ever heard. Sounded as if it were in the back pasture, but the house shook as if something had hit it. Arthur jumped a mile, and I never saw such a look on her face. Yes, what was that? she asked. Shoot, now, nothing but the freshet, I told her. But she kept on about it. You reckon that shoot star fell in our back pasture, Hez? Well, now, I don't know it did nothing like that. I told her, but she was jittery as an old hen, and it weren't like her no how. She said it sounded like trouble, and I finally quietened her down by saying I'd saddle Kate up and go have a look. I kind of thought, though I didn't tell Martha, that somebody's house had floated away in the fresh and run aground in our back pasture. So I saddled up Kate and told Martha to get some hot rum ready in case there was some poor soul run aground back there, and I rode Kate back to the back pasture. It was mostly uphill because the top of the pasture is on high ground, and it sloped down to the creek on the other side of the rise. Well, I reached the top of the hill and looked down. The creek were a regular river now, rushing along like Niagara. On the other side of it was a stand of timber, and then the slope of Shattuck Mountain. 
and I saw right away at the long streak where all the timber had been cut out and a big scoop with roots standing up in the air and a big slot of rocks down to the water. It was still raining a mite and the ground was sloshy and squanchy underfoot. Kate scrunched her hooves and got real bulky, not liking it a bit. When we got to the top of the pasture, she started to whine and wicker and stamp, and no matter how loud I woed, she kept on a stamp, and I was plumb scared she'd pitch me off in the mud. Then I started to smell a funny smell, like something burning. Now, don't ask me how anything could burn in all that water, because I don't know. When we came up on the rise, I saw the contraption. Reverend, it was the most tarnal, crazy contraption I ever saw in my life. It was bigger nor my cow shed, and it was long and thin and as shiny as Martha's old pewter pitcher her ma brought from England. It had a pair of red rods sticking out behind and a crazy globe fitted up where the top ought to be. It was stuck in the mud, turned halfway over on the little slide of roots and rocks, and I could see what had happened all right. The thing must have been... Now, Reverend, you can say what you like, but that thing must have flew across Shattuck and landed on the slope in the trees and turned over and slid down the hill. That must have been the crash we heard. The rods weren't just red, they were red hot. I could hear them sizzle as the rain hit them. In the middle of the infernal contraption there was a door, and it hung all to others if every hinge on it had been wrenched halfway off. As I pushed old Kate alongside it, I heard somebody holler alongside the contraption. I didn't know how to get the words, but it must have been for help, because I looked down and there was a man a-flopping along in the water. He was a big fella, and he wasn't swimming, just thrashing and hollering. So I pulled off my coat and boots and hove in after him. The stream was running fast, but he was near the edge, and I managed to catch on to an old tree root and hang on, keeping his head out of the water till I got my feet aground. Then I hauled him onto the bank. Up above me, Kate was still whining and raising Ned, and I shouted at her as I bent over the man. Well, Reverend, he sure did give me a surprise. Weren't no proper man I'd ever seen before. He was wearing some kind of red clothes, real shiny and sort of stretchy and not wet from the water like you'd expect, but dry and it felt like that silk and India rubber stuff mixed together. It was such a bright red that at first I didn't see the blood on it. When I did, I knew he were a goner. His chest were all stuff in, smashed to pieces. One of the old tree roots must have jabbed him as the current flung him down. I thought he were dead already, but then he opened up his eyes. A funny color they were greeny yellow and i swear reverend when he opened them eyes i felt he was reading my mind i thought maybe he might be one of them circus fellers in their flying contraptions that hang at the bottom of a balloon he spoke to me in english kind of choky and stiff not like joe the portuguese sailor like those tarnal dumb frenchies up Kennedy way but well funny he said my baby in ship get baby he tried to say more, but his eyes went shut, and he moaned hard. I yelled, God Almighty! Excuse me, Reverend, but I was so blame upset. That's just what I did say. God Almighty, man, you mean there's a baby in that there ding full contraption? He just moaned, so after spreading my coat around the man a little bit, I just plunged in that there river again. Reverend, I heard tell once about some tomfool idiot going over Niagara in a barrel, and I tell you it was like that when I tried crossing that fresh to reach the contraption. I went under and down and was whacked by floating sticks and whirled around in the freshet. But somehow, I don't know how, set by the pure grace of God, I got across that raging torrent and clumb up to where the crazy dingfold machine was sitting. Ship, he called it. But that word no ship, Reverend. It was some flying dragon kind of thing. It was a real scary looking thing, but I clumb up the little door and hauled myself inside it. And, sure enough, there was other people in the cabin, only they was all dead. There was a lady and a man and some kind of an animal looked like a bobcat, only smaller, with a funny-shaped rooster comb thing on its head. They all, even the cat thing, was wearing those shiny, stretchy clothes, and they all was so battered and smashed I didn't even bother to hunt for their heartbeats. I could see by a look they was dead as a doornail. Then I heard a funny little whimper, like a kitten, and then a funny rubber cushion thing there's a little boy baby, looked about six months old. He was howling lusty enough, and when I lifted him out of the cradle kind of thing, I saw why. That boy baby, he was wet, and his little arm was twisted under him. That there flying contraption must have smashed down awful hard, but that rubber hammock was so soft and cushiony all it did to him was jolt him good. I looked around, but I couldn't find anything to wrap him in, and the baby didn't have a stitch on him except a sort of spongy paper diaper. What is sin? So I finally lifted up the lady, and with a long cape thing around her, and I took the cape off her real gentle. 
I knew she was dead and she wouldn't be needing it, and that boy baby would catch his death if I took him out bare naked like that. She was probably the baby's ma. A right pretty woman she was, but smashed up something shameful. Uh, anyhow, to make a long story short, I got that baby boy back across that Niagara Fall somehow and laid him down by his paw. Man opened his eyes kind and said in a choky voice, Take care, baby. I told him I would and said I'd try to get him up to the house where Martha could doctor him. The man told me not to bother. I dying, he says. We come from planet Star up there. Crash here. His voice trailed off into a language I couldn't understand, and he looked like he was praying. I bent over him and held his head on my knees real easy, and I said, Don't worry, mister. I'll take care of your little fella until your folks come after him. Before God, I will. So the man closed his eyes, and I said, Our father, which art in heaven, and when I got through, he was dead. I got him up on Kate, but he was cruel heavy for all he was, such a tall, skinny fella. Then I wrapped that there baby up in the cape thing and took him home and give him to Martha. And the next day I buried the fella in the South Meadow, and next meeting day we had the baby baptized Matthew Daniel Emmett and brung him up just like our own kids. That's all. All? Mr. Emmett, didn't you ever find out where that ship really came from? Why, Reverend, he said it come from a star. Dying men don't lie, you know that. I asked the teacher about them planets he mentioned, and she says that on one of the planets, can't rightly remember the name, March or Mark or something like that. She says some big scientist feller with a telescope saw canals on that planet, and they'd have to be pretty near as big as this here Erie Canal to see them so far off, and if they could build canals on that planet, I don't know why they couldn't build a flying machine. I went back the next day when the water was down a little to see if I couldn't get the rest of them folks and bury them, but the flying machine had broke up and washed down the creek. Martha's still got the cape thing. She's a powerful saving woman. We never did tell Matt, though. Might make him feel funny to think he didn't really belong to us. But, but, Mr. Emmett, didn't anybody ask questions about the baby? Where you got it? Well, now, I allow they was curious, because Martha hadn't been in the family way and they knew it. But up here, folks minds their own business pretty well, and I just let them wonder. I told Liza Grace I'd found her new little brother in the back pasture, and of course it was the truth. When Liza Grace growed up, she thought it was just one of those yarns old folks tell the little shavers. And has Matthew ever shown any differences from the other children that you could see? Well, Reverend, not so as you could notice it. He's powerful smart, but his real pa and ma must have been right smart, too, to build a flying contraption that could come so far. Of course, when he were about twelve years old, he started reading folks' minds, which didn't seem exactly right. He'd tell Marthy what I was thinking and things like that. He was just at the pesky age. Liza Grace and Minnie were both a courtin' then, and he'd drive their boy friends crazy telling them what Liza Grace and Minnie were thinking, and tease the gals by telling them what the boys were thinking about. There weren't no harm to the boy, though. It was all teasing, but it just weren't decent somehow. So I took him out behind the woodshed and gave his britches a good dustin' just to remind him that that kind of thing weren't polite no how. And Reverend Dunn, he ain't never done it since. End of Year of the Big Thaw by Marion Zimmer Bradley Recorded by Tom Hackett, djhackett.newgrounds.com